uh, five seconds, or 10 seconds. Good morning, everyone. We're very delighted that you're joining us for this panel today as a part of our Terrorism Week coverage that's ongoing with a series of events that we started uh, most recently on uh, Tuesday with the keynote by H.R. McMaster. Uh, we're very delighted that we've got a great panel lined up here for you today. Uh, many of you may be, may be wondering about the technological twist uh, to our Terrorism Week. Uh, we wanted to bring this to you because of the changing impact of technology on warfare. And we thought that it'd be great to kind of have a uh, a fresh wrinkle to what we're doing uh, with our Terrorism Week coverage. And, and we really got a great group of people uh, here today of speakers and uh, be sharing their insights. And we're very happy that we have Dan Gettinger here, who's going to moderate the panel. Uh, it should be a very lively panel. And we encourage everyone uh, over the course of the hour uh, to develop your questions and feel free to ask them in the chat room. We'll try to get to them as best we can. And, um, and many of you don't, maybe not be familiar with Dan Gettinger, uh, but he's an analyst at the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies in Washington, DC. He's a founder and former director of the Center for the Study of Drone at, at Bard College. He's also the author of the Drone Data Book. So if you haven't seen that, grab a copy. So uh, we're delighted that Dan, uh, years of expertise in covering and, and very much a, uh, one of the key experts in the United States on drone warfare, uh, in the rise of modern drones. And so we're delighted that he was uh, agreed to, to, to moderate this panel for us today. So uh, thank you. And I'll turn the floor over to Dan. Thanks so much, Glenn. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for the invitation. Um, pleased to be joined today by uh, John Kasapoglu, at, uh, who's the director of the Defense and Security Program at the Istanbul-based think tank, uh, EDAM. And he's a fellow at the German Research Institute, SWP. Uh, we're also great uh, to be joined by uh, Mr. Ryan Oliver, uh, who is the Manager of Innovation Strategy and Planning at Madison Springfields. Uh, both have written wonderful pieces on, on uh, drones in uh, North Africa and the Caucasus. Uh, we're going to turn them over the panel over to them for some brief remarks and then head into Q&A. Uh, so Ryan, why don't you uh, take it away? Thanks so much, Dan, and uh, great to be here. I'm grateful for the Jamestown Foundation for hosting this event and glad to be speaking with John as well. Um, to start things out, looking at Chinese drone sales in the Middle East and North Africa, I think it reflects a real combination of strategy and opportunity. Um, first, uh, in terms of the strategy, China has invested pretty deeply, obviously, in the development of drones, but what that reflects is the prioritization that they've put on the uh, security implications, the political implications, and, and the economic uh, implications as well. So looking through Chinese strategic documents, uh, the ones available publicly at least, uh, the, the role of drones in uh, China's present and future operating doctrine is, is very well emphasized. President Xi has spoken specifically about the increased importance of UAVs in Chinese operating concepts and strategies. It reflects also in investment priorities as well. Uh, as you see, the Chinese civil military fusion program that hopes to capitalize on the intersection of, of state-supported military interests, but also um, private sector innovation. Um, it, it's a program that the drone development in China stands to benefit greatly from. And so looking at those domestic conditions pushing the drone industry forward, um, you also have this massive opportunity created in the international uh, drone marketplace by a couple of key factors. Um, key players in the Middle East in, er, in the drone sales market are limited in how they've been able to engage with Middle East and North African buyers. Um, the US, one of the leading drone uh, developers in the world, um, has been limited by the MTCR, the Missile Technology Control Regime, a 1987 agreement that um, has been uh, has included unarmed systems uh, up until now, although there is conversation about reinterpretation and just this summer in July, uh, the president advanced a reinterpretation of some key language that has opened the door for greater US involvement in that market. Um, so it's, it's while over the last 10 years, um, there has been a greater opportunity there, um, that seems to be shifting a little bit now, um, at least from the Chinese perspective. And then another key player in the drone market, Israel, um, 
has sells drones all over the world, but for geopolitical reasons and security reasons, um, does not do so in the Middle East and North Africa. And so with those two key players out of the drone market in that region, China has had a natural opportunity to uh, invest and develop and build its nascent drone industry and find uh, willing and welcome buyers in, in key countries across that region that have been denied the same resources from, from a US seller, for example. Um, even US partners like Jordan or Saudi Arabia have, have been denied US drone purchases in the past. And so with the Chinese alternative available, uh, they have seized that opportunity and, and leaned into it. And so looking at Chinese drone sales in the region, um, Chinese, the Chinese have sold, dro sold drones to the UAE, to Egypt, to Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Iraq, Jordan, and Sudan. And looking across those countries, there's a very clear connection between the drone sales, or at least coincidence between the drone sales and the degree to which Chinese, the Chinese view these as strategic partners in the region. China doesn't have formal alliances, but what it does have are varying levels of partnership with different countries. And so um, at the same time that these developments of drone sales and, and uh, deeper security ties seem to be developing, um, so too have those partnerships risen and deepen across economic and political ties as well. Looking at the impact of those sales on conflicts in the region, almost every one of these players is involved directly or indirectly with an ongoing conflict. So for example, with the UAE, you have active drone activity in both Yemen more directly and in Libya um, more indirectly yet still rather with rather strong linkages. Um, Saudi Arabia too is involved, is leading the coalition uh, incorporating UAE in Yemen um, and benefiting from Chinese drone usage there as well. With Iraq, um, you have CH3s and CH4s being used to combat IS, uh, Islamic State, in, in Iraq itself. And Algeria, while they haven't flown um, combat missions yet, uh, Egypt has flown, it, it, there's reporting that Egypt has used uh, drones in the Sinai uh, for at least surveillance purposes. Uh, and so seeing the different ways that drones are being employed on the battlefield, uh, Chinese drones specifically, uh, it, it shows, it suggests the impact that these drones have on shaping the battle space. Um, on the one hand, you have these countries in the Middle East, North Africa that have immense amounts of, of territory that are inhospitable and that previously it's been incredibly uh, manpower intensive or, or impossible to maintain situational awareness of. And so using these systems for uh, enhanced situational awareness of that territory and early threat detection is an invaluable asset for regimes seeking to maintain control and to suppress insurgencies. Um, at the same time, um, looking beyond their borders, it, it provides states like the United Arab Emirates, a smaller state with limited regional geographic reach, an opportunity to weigh in and exert influence in conflicts further afield. So looking at Libya, um, the UAE's involvement there and their supplying of Chinese made drones has given them a ready opportunity to weigh in on a conflict far from far from their territory and to tip the scales of, of the balance of power within that specific arena. So in that sense, it provides a geopolitical tool for exerting influence a little bit further um, than, they, than they would otherwise be able to. On the other side, um, these conflicts, the use of drones, um, I believe it was Secretary of Defense Robert Gates that said, you know, drones enable a style of warfare that is often perceived as bloodless, painless, and odorless. Um, and so it, it removes a lot of the uh, attrition, attritive qualities of war that create friction and, and sometimes contribute to resolution. Um, and so in some respects, the use of drones in these conflicts um, plays a role in, in mowing the grass in a way that might perpetuate conflict. That mowing the grass term base is essentially saying that um, you're able to address immediate threats without resolving uh, conflicts at a more significant fundamental level. Um, furthermore, these sorts of systems, um, there's a reason why in a, that the US and that others have been hesitant to sell um, these systems to autocratic regimes or regimes without the same understanding of human rights and civilian collateral damage um, as, as the Chinese have. The Chinese have demonstrated less restraint in that respect. And so um, there is a risk of um, higher civilian casualties of um, uses of drone systems that don't necessarily align with 
our understanding in the US of, of human values or of acceptable collateral damage. And so in these different ways, the proliferation of drones and especially um, armed drones from China um, has a, a very immediate impact on how things might play out on the battlefield and the implications for the, the countries and the people within them. Looking at how, what the impact is on Chinese influence, um, immediately for, for, for China itself, this offers an opportunity to build more credibility, build more uh, of market share in the, in the as an arms exporter, and also it provides uh, much needed battlefield experience for these systems. The U.S. has had the opportunity to, to test its systems over the past couple of decades in active battlefields. Countries like Russia too have found opportunities in Syria and elsewhere to test their systems, and so um, China, through its export markets, uh, is able to see how its systems perform in varying environments and to, to garner some of that experience um, in ways that it wouldn't otherwise be able to, given its lack of combat involvement. Um, furthermore, these drone sales offer an opportunity for China to deepen bilateral ties. Like I mentioned, China enjoys uh, strategic partnerships with each of these countries, with UAE, with Egypt, with Saudi Arabia and Algeria. Each one of those has been designated a comprehensive strategic partner, which is um, a, a high, significantly high level of partnership indicator for China, China diplomatically. Um, and that translates in different ways in those bilateral relationships. Each one of those countries, um, there are, China has significant energy interests in those countries um, and drone sales aren't necessarily um, the end all be all when China is looking at it as a tool of diplomatic power, or a tool of statecraft, if you will. But it's something, it's, it's a, an arrow in its quiver that it can offer as, as a means of something, something at the trade table. And so when you look at how China engages with these countries, whether they're offering to boost tourism or whether they're offering to sell drones, it's something that they're able to offer in, in exchange for a, a more transactional and a deeper uh, bilateral relationship. And then finally, the impact this has on multilateral relations. So I think the clearest case of this comes out when you see um, China leveraging its relationships with these various countries for multilateral issues. Last summer, there was um, revelations about the conditions in Xinjiang uh, and the detention centers there came out and uh, a number of countries wrote a, a public letter to the UN condemning China's treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Um, four days later, a second letter was published um, supporting China's human rights development and supporting uh, its actions to counter extremism. Um, and an, of those countries that were signatories on that second letter, almost all of them were recipients of drones, um, of, of Chinese drones in the Middle East and North Africa. And so um, UAE, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Algeria, all comprehensive strategic partners all supported China's policies uh, in Xinjiang, despite the fact that these are majority Muslim countries. Um, importantly, the second letter uh, left out the word Muslim or Islam and, re and didn't refer to that at all, and rather just focused on the fact that they had a shared interest in combating extremism. And so when you see the role of drones, uh, Chinese drones in the Middle East and North Africa, I think you find, um, a situation where China is very transactional and very opportunistically finding ways to enhance the power of uh, those regime, regimes it's friendly with, um, capitalize on commonalities, ignore the differences at this point, and find ways to move in and extend its influence in the region. Great. Thanks so much, Ryan. Uh, John, do you want to say a few words? Hi, so thank you so much for inviting me and big thanks to all the organizers of this great event. Uh, well, my take will primarily be on Turkey's drone warfare. Uh, you know, the rising drone power to some, I read some articles in the national interest indicating that Turkey gonna be the, the Middle East next uh, drone superpower. Uh, the Turkish robotic warfare capabilities definitely turn the tide in Azerbaijan, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in, in uh, Libya also saved the Tripoli government uh, from falling uh, into General Haftar's forces hands. Uh, as to Turkey's expeditions in Syria, the drone, drone power uh, proved to be a game changer. Uh, here I will try to shed some light on the, the conceptual development of Turkish drone warfare understanding and where to go from here. But, but it, it all started with you know, four pillars, the, Tur the Turkish drone modernization. 
that the first aim was minimizing the casualties because the Turkish army is getting more and more expeditionary and Turkey is facing grave threats, especially non-state threats in, 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 at its Middle Eastern doorstep. And the Turkish army has frequently uh, so far uh, waged cross-border operations into Syria, into Iraq, and these are really dangerous battle zones. And also we are having a, a, a terrorist threat in Turkey, which is interrelated with the, the cross-border flashpoints. So casualty minimization was, I think, the first pillar of Turkish drone understanding. Secondly, with the Turkish air force is also involving more and more in, in these expeditions. Uh, you know, a captured pilot situation is more than a, a casualty, a, 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 another killed in action uh, on the disc. We know that from the Jordanian pilot experience in the hands of ISIS. We know that in the, in the recent clashes between Pakistan and India, the captured Indian pilot became a political asset in the hands of uh, the Pakistani military. So drones actually are uh, assets that, that uh, prevent that kind of captured pilot uh, situation, which is more than a casualty, which is more than a prisoner of war, which is a, a political asset in the hands of the capturer. And also the Turkish experience showed that the drones are not only part of a targeted killing program, but can be a a force multiplier in combined arms warfare, especially if your adversary is lacking an edge in the electromagnetic spectrum, because hunting down apparently hunting down drones is not the same with legacy air defenses, legacy integrated air defenses, because of many reasons, like uh, the different radar cross section, like the different signature of these assets, uh, like the, the 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 type of layer defenses that you need to hunt them down. But any anyhow. It, it, it shows that, the, the experience shows that these four pillars shaped uh, the Turkish uh, drone uh, modernization. Uh, here at this point, I'd like to draw attention to two uh, key, two game changer experiences uh, that, that uh, played a huge role in uh, the Turkish contemporary drone warfare capacity as to lessons learned and also the implications of, of waging drone warfare. One is Operation Olive Branch, back in 2018. In the operational wheel branch, the, the, the most uh, striking uh, uh, feature or, or the most striking thing with the operation, I'd say about one third to one fourth of the direct or indirect kills of the Turkish military uh, in the face of the PKK terrorist threat and its offshoots in Syria, uh, between 25% uh, to 30%, directly or indirectly uh, conducted by unmanned systems, unmanned aerial systems. So one third of the kill scorecard is really something in, in modern warfare if it comes from unmanned systems. The, the second uh, big experience was the beginning of 2020s when the Syrian Arab Air Force along with the Russian Aerospace Forces killed 36 uh, Turkish troops uh, close to Idlib and then the Turkish military waged a punitive operation on Assad's forces uh, within a, a week, it took out the majority of the Syrian Arab army's northern deployments. The, and, and the predominant asset here was, again, Turkish unmanned systems, but the Turkish robotic warfare approach showed something more complex here, which was the integration between Turkey's land-based fires, artillery and multiple large rocket systems, and the drones. Drones simply worked as uh, ISTAR, the Intelligence Surveillance Target Acquisition and Reconnaissance Asset, and also right after the artillery salvos, they, they functioned as a uh, battle damage assessment uh, assets. And in both operations, the Turkish armed forces also used extensive drone uh, footage, used extensive drone footage as information warfare uh, leverage. This was really interesting. Then, uh, and, and, and one more point here, uh, both the lessons learned from both uh, expeditions, especially the, the, the clash with the Syrian Arab Air Force, Turkish drones, specifically Bayraktar TB2 uh, of the Baikar company, uh, built a fame for itself as the Panzer Hunter, as the, the, the mobile air defense system hunter. Uh, in the hands of uh, the, the, the Syrian Arab Air Defense Forces. And then this experience was extended to Libya. Uh, we we uh, spotted many uh, incidents that Turkish drones uh, uh, were hunting down for the air defenses. It boils down to what I said in the, in the, in the first uh, place uh, during the opening of my speech, 
that if the adversary is lacking a network situational awareness and an edge in electromagnetic spectrum with legacy SAM systems, with legacy air defenses that were best designed against uh, hunting down manned aircraft, actually, I wouldn't say useless, but uh, proved to be not that capable against, against uh, robotic warfare in, in the skies. Now, then we came to the third pillar of lessons learned after the Syrian expeditions and the, the Libyan aspect, which was the recent Karabakh war uh, between uh, the Azerbaijan armed forces and the, the Armenian occupation formations in, in, in Nagorno-Karabakh and, uh, and territories around it. Well, we saw uh, in a nutshell, Turkey not only transferred uh, hardware equipment to Azerbaijan to its natural ally, but also concepts of operations and doctrines because the Azerbaijani use of drones uh, mimic the Turkish use of drones, specifically Operation Spring Shield in the beginning of 2020 against the Syrian armed forces that I touched upon uh, in, in four uh, aspects. One was using drones as a force multiplier in combined arms warfare. We saw that the Azerbaijani armor and mechanized formations uh, advanced with, uh, with drone support. And secondly, the Azerbaijani MOD's Twitter account turned into some kind of drone footage, uh, you know, broadcaster uh, using this uh, footage as, as uh, uh, information warfare uh, input. Uh, we also saw that the Azerbaijani systematically used drones to hunt down uh, Armenian air defense systems, including two S-300 strategic SAMs, uh, which uh, which uh, uh, followed suit uh, with Turkey's suppression of air, enemy air defenses uh, functions. And two uh, issues that I'd like to uh, bring to your attention here is one which was incidental, uh, which was ju just one single incident that we spotted. But if Azerbaijan or any other nation can extend it to a general practice, it's going to really be something. Azerbaijan hunted down an Armenian a scud uh, launcher, mobile scud, road mobile scud launcher uh, with a Turkish drone. Uh, so recalling the hunt for the, the Iraqi scuds uh, of Saddam Hussein's arsenal and what kind of headache uh, they were, I think if, if we can, uh, uh, still it is the baby steps, still one single incident wouldn't tell anything, but it would hint at something that drones can be used against hunting down uh, drones can be used in hunting down uh, mobile uh, ballistic missile launchers. And in terms of the, the, the industry, uh, the Turkish experience with Azerbaijan was really important because, you know, it was really sentimental uh, and it was really iki devlet bir millet understand two states, but one nation understanding and everything was revolving around it. But Turkey entered a market, a weapons market that was dominated by Israel in unmanned systems which is really something in terms of the future of the Turkish defense industries. And even the, the CEO of Baikar, the makers of Bayraktar TB2 drone, uh, Haluk Bayraktar himself tweeted that the, the, the era of tanks is over. Now the unmanned systems rule. Uh, that tweet, uh, we can agree or disagree with that. I partially agree with, with this military analysis, but that tweet coming from a the leader in the, in the sector in Turkey was really something. Uh, two points, and I'm going to stop here and, and leave the floor for questions. Uh, of course, we are looking at the, the platforms and the systems as the, the, the first and foremost enabler of drone warfare, because after all, this is drone warfare, but there is a rocket science behind that. Uh, the, the, the rocket science behind that is Roketsan, Turkey's uh, smart munition and rocket and missile uh, uh, proliferator. Uh, and this is now the official motto of rocket science. Yes, it is rocket science because Bayraktar TB2 and Anka, another uh, Turkish drone, has limited payloads. Uh, and it, it was rocket science work that, that uh, packed everything, every single blast that you saw in, in the drone footage uh, in eight kilograms simply uh, with smart munition. Uh, and this was really something from now on what to expect from Turkish drone modernization. Well, again, in a nutshell, we're going to see heavier systems like Aksungur, like Akinci. For instance, Ak Akinci will have uh, 1,350 uh, kilograms over one ton uh, combat payload, which will include really exotic features like air launch cruise missiles with more than 200 uh, kilometers range, which can turn it into a deep strike asset. Air-to-air -air and including beyond uh, visual range air-to-air -air, uh, missiles 
up until now, we don't have a score of uh, an unmanned system killing a, a, a manned aircraft. But maybe from now on, we can see, and maybe it can, it can just open the, the, the Pandora's box for that. Uh, Aksungur, uh, coming from the makers of Anka, will carry a sonar boy in a magnetic anomaly detector, which will make it simply an anti-submarine warfare asset. Uh, again, a force multiplier for the Turkish Navy, which is already being dramatized. Well, to, to just, uh, you know, put some caveats to the, to the very promising picture that I drew here, I can name two caveats basically for the future of Turkish drone industry. For the unmanned systems, especially remote control systems, Turkish defense industry work miracles. And now uh, we are having heavier systems with heavier payloads, uh, you know, more uh, game changer uh, weaponry. They will, be, they will be able to carry like uh, air launch cruise missiles, like sonar boys, so on, so on. Uh, but the, the international trend is going not only into larger systems, but smarter systems with more autonomy. So in order to build autonomy in robotic warfare, you need you really need to have a, a defense technological and industrial base supported by huge scientific research, ranging from evolutionary biology to mathematics to aerospace engineering. And you know, the great power competition in AI, we compare the United States and China as to the citations, the number of publications they, they do in a year, the, the citations these publications take, uh, the number of research institutes working in these areas. This is a big question mark for Turkey. The Turkish defense industry really worked miracles, but I cannot say the same as a fusion, as a holistic vision of the Turkish science base as, uh, as a whole. But one could also argue here that, you know, uh, in, the, in the beginning of this century, where were the Russians as to cyber warfare in terms of citations, publications, uh, the same goes as to AI discussions. Yes, the Russians are not there, but they were not there already in the cyber, uh, but now they're a great power. So a, a big question mark. The second question mark here is, and I'm gonna stop here, robotic systems is not only drones and unmanned aerial systems. UGV sector, unmanned ground vehicle sector is a big sector. And the integration between these two cross domain uh, horizons uh, really need to augment, really need to just follow uh, the, the success and build on what Turkey has achieved uh, up until now. Uh, the, the big heads of the sector in Turkey, like Havelsan, like Aselsan, are now involved in a recent project to develop unmanned tanks, it is called in Turkey, in San Sistankar. Uh, but, you know, for many reasons, navigation, the, the setting, the environment, UGV is a far different animal than, than UAV, so it remains to be seen. I'm going to stop here and give the room for questions. Uh, and again, we want to extend thanks uh, for the organizers of this great event. Great to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, John. Uh, and everyone who's listening and watching, uh, you can tune in. You can ask questions by the Q&A function in Zoom if you have anything. Um, John, I want to start with you uh, regarding uh, Turkish personnel involvement in in these conflicts. Uh, one of the interesting, one of the unique aspects of Turkey's program is the degree to which it integrated drones in each of the military services, as well as the national uh, military and the national civilian police and the national military intelligence agency, the MIT. Uh, which of the services is taking the lead in operations in Idlib? What are these? What is Turkey uh, learning as it progresses to from you know, Syria to uh, Libya to Nagorno-Karabakh, um, and uh, and yeah, which what what can we learn? What is what what are the Turkish personnel learning from these experiences? Well, thank you so much. That's a great question. You, you know, uh, as you write the point about as to drone warfare, it it it, it created a across the spectrum culture in in the Turkish a larger security apparatus. I wouldn't even call it the, 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 the Turkish armed forces because apart from Turkish armed forces, the Turkish gendarmerie, the Turkish national intelligence and the Turkish police uh, has been uh, users of, of uh, the unmanned systems. Uh, and I think that the administration was really, really careful here, uh, not turning the drone thing into a branch thing or a part of the interbranch uh, competition within the Turkish security apparatus. As to Idlib, it follows suit, actually. You're going to be surprised that even the Turkish Navy took part in Idlib uh, because the Turkish uh, Marine Commandos and uh, the equivalent of 
the U.S. Navy SEALs Turkish Sat and Sas, the underwater commando detachments uh, from the Turkish Navy. They are really battle-hardened elite units that have been taking part in counterterrorism operations uh, for decades. Even they uh, took part in, 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 in the Syrian expedition. Apart from that, the Turkish Air Force uh, in the in the Uber tour, in the uh, at the outset of the Operation Olive Branch, a uh, Turkish Air Force flew uh, 72 pieces of aircraft, which is more or less 25 percent of the entire arsenal. As to the drone use, I can also say that it was across the spectrum because the, the integration between fires, land-based fires, and drones necessitated a close coordination between the Air Force and the Army. Uh, using drones as targeted close air support and, and immediate close air support assets, it also necessitated a, a huge uh, integration between the, uh, the, the ground troops, be it uh, the elite of the Navy, elite of the Army, the gendarmerie, and the drone forces. But also we see another trend in northern Iraq and Syria uh, against the tactical level uh, and operational level ring leaders of the PKK terrorist organization, Turkey has been uh, running uh, you know, targeted operations. And uh, obviously the Turkish national intelligence is also involved in that. So I can say that both the, involve, both the force generation patterns in Turkey's expeditions and also the use of drones is now across the spectrum inter-branch thing in Turkey. It also created a, a capability, but also a strategic culture, I think, in the Turkish uh, wider, broader uh, security apparatus. Great, thanks so much. Uh, Ryan, I wanna to turn to you uh, with a question, a similar question about um, Chinese uh, drone operation in, or the operation of Chinese drones in Libya. Um, who do we know about who is operating uh, these aircraft or what do we know about their operation? Are they uh, contractors, are they Emirati personnel, are they Chinese contractors? Um, and can you tell me a little bit about what uh, operationally the UAE the Emiratis are, are gaining from uh, using Chinese made drones in a theater like Libya? Yeah, Dan, that's a, that's a great question. That's a complicated one too. Um, I think based on, with a lot of these situations, there's a lot of mixed reporting out there. Um, and I think generally, um, you know, there is a, a, a situation where there was a, a report about um, six Emirati members of the military that um, were returned to the Emirates um, after having been killed in, in combat action um, with sort of vague implications that it was it was actually coming from Libya. Um, and so, you know, trying to piece it together and then figure out exactly who's doing what in terms of operations is, uh, is a little bit tricky, um, uh, particularly out in the open source. But I think what you see both both in Libya and in um, in Yemen is that um, the, the Emiratis are getting the opportunity to 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 employ modern systems uh, in a way that, that direct, has direct impacts on the battlefield far from home for them. And so one clear example of that was uh, in, uh, in 2016, the employment of uh, drones to kill, to essentially assassinate a, a Houthi leader in Yemen. Um, it, was, it was a clear example of a, a UAE led precision strike um, that had an immediate and significant impact on the, the battlefield and also sort of the, the political environment around that conflict. And so seeing um, those processes uh, iterate and recur over time. This is a, a progression in terms of the lessons learned and the improvement as, as things move forward. One of the setbacks uh, that comes with some of these systems is that there have been, um, one of the criticisms of these Chinese made systems is um, some reliability issues. And so um, in Algeria, there have been well-documented um, uh, crashes of the CH systems um, that have this satellite imagery supporting that. And then in Iraq, uh, which has used an, uh, the CH systems um, over the last few years to conduct surveillance and drone strikes. Um, there are, I think, this one, uh, as of this last year, this one that's still operational out of the batch of 12 that they received a little while back. And so um, finding ways to keep them in the air has been a, been a struggle. But um, to mitigate some of that, there there is a, uh, in 2017, uh, a deal with Saudi Arabia um, enabled the development of a facility uh, for drone uh, production and repair uh, in Saudi Arabia. And the thought is that that can both help to um, deepen the relationship with Saudi Arabia, but also provide local support and maintenance to others in the region, helping to uh, improve that turnaround time and to incorporate those lessons learned as you go. And given UAE's close relationship with Saudi Arabia, it stands to 
stands to um, believe that that will they will they will benefit from that as well. Um, and so looking looking forward, I think continued employment of these resources in these battle spaces, um, it, it, they're going to continue to refine and improve the way that they're employing and, and hopefully mitigate some of those risks. Yeah, that's great. I wanted to pick up on something you just said about um, about Iraq's uh, CH4s not really being in use. And we also heard that, you know, Jordan wants to sell their CH4s, Kazakhstan maybe, you know, switching their wing loons for, for Turkish Bayraktars. We'll see uh, in the coming months. But um, picking on that, you know, the big news obviously from this year was Serbia with the CH-92s and, wing loon, and uh, Nigeria upgrading to the wing loon twos. Where do you see the future for Chinese exports of these aircraft? I mean, you know, a lot of these customers, they, they have Chinese drones. I mean, uh, upgrading those or, or, or new countries um, in, uh, in other uh, markets? Again, that's, that's a great question, Dan. And I think there's, there's a couple of factors that play in here. First, um, the fact that China has had an op- a window of opportunity over the last 10 years because of the factors I mentioned earlier to, to penetrate some markets that were previously untapped. Um, at the time, a lot of those different buyers only had that option available to them for the procurement of uh, surveillance or, or armed drones. Um, going forward, it looks like that will not be as much the case. First of all, as John has well pointed out, Turkey is emerging as a drone power. Um, and watching that development, those re- the refinement of the technology and the operational concepts, it you know while there isn't necessarily the same defense industrial base in place and the investment in R and D that you might see in a U.S. or a China, um, there is at least a viable alternative in some respects for for systems uh, to procure. Second, the U.S. loosening its export controls on UAVs uh, creates another option. Um, the Chinese systems are typically at a significantly lower price point um, than their U.S. counterparts, but but also uh, the capability drop off and the reliability drop off is also noteworthy. So, um, you know, depending on what folks are willing to pay for and what uh, going forward it could determine how that marketplace plays out. But in terms of where the Chinese drone uh, industry goes from here, you know, I think it goes in, th- it looks like it's going in three directions. One, get smarter um, in terms of the software, in terms of the targeting, um, in terms of the ability to swarm. Uh, those all sort of uh, integrate with Chinese investments in AI, in satellite technology, in different systems that uh, come together for a, a smarter and more capable drone system. Second is um, higher altitude, longer endurance. Um, so China is, is investing in hail systems as well. Um, to date, it's only those sort of the CH Rainbow series and the wing loons that are really penetrating international markets. But going forward, uh, Chinese investment could pay out if it's able to develop those. However, uh, setbacks, China's traditional weakness in, in that sense has been its engine development. Um, it, it has fallen short in terms of its ability to uh, produce engines domestically for these systems. And so that has handicapped its ability to really push to the next level in terms of drone quality and reliability. And the third area that Chinese drones uh, look to be headed is, is into the stealth market. Um, um, Chinese stealth drones, it's still uh, relatively nascent, but emerging and whether or not that becomes a for, for export and at what point is, remains to be seen. But I think those three buckets are kind of the directions that the Chinese drone industry seems to be heading. That's great. Yeah, I wanted to pick up actually on the uh, on the engines, but uh, turn it over to John. Uh, one of the things that we saw um, in the wake of the Nagorno Karabakh conflict was some of the suppliers of uh, subsystems for the Bayraktar TB2, um, particularly the um, the engines, the the uh, Rotax engines, and the uh, the sensor ball, um, sort of speaking out and saying that they you know plan to uh, to uh, stop or, or significantly roll back exports of these systems to um, to Turkey. What can you tell us about where Turkey is in developing their indigenous alternatives to these subsystems? And, uh, you know, is, for example, uh, Turkey's or Baikar's decision to go with Ukrainian engines for the Akinji drone, I mean, is that a, is that a worrying sign for, for Turkey in, in this regard? Well, thank you so much. That's a great question. First, like, let us, you know, handle the issue separately as to the power pack and the sensor, the, the Canadian thing, the Canadian affair. As to the, the engine, I think, you know, Turkey resisted uh, for a long time as to engine technology, not only in its unmanned systems, but look at the Bonanza with Rolls-Royce in the, in the TFX, in the, uh, we call it now 
MMU, Milli Muharip Uçak, the National Combat Aircraft, the Turkish Indigenous Fifth Generation Aircraft. The, 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 the basic issue with Rolls-Royce was the, the IP uh, rights and the engine and the co-production co of the Turkish industry and all revolved uh, around that. Uh, look at the problems with the Turkish main battle tank project, Altai. The main problem revolved uh, around the, the engine. This, this power pack uh, and producing power pack and advanced engines uh, is not easily, you know, mixing up with the Turkish defense industry's motto of Yerli, the indigenous and national. You know, extending the indigenous and national capacity in every single segment of arms production, in weaponry production, is not that easy, especially when it comes to the, the, the advanced segments like, like the power packs. That being said, uh, there is another aspect of Turkish defense modernization, which is non-NATO partnerships worked much better compared to NATO partnerships up until now. The, the, the biggest two example, I don't mean Russia here, because Russia, especially after, after Crimea, is not a usual, let's say, non-NATO partner, but look at Turkey's uh, traditional non-NATO partnerships, South Korea, uh, that was the mastermind uh, behind Turkey's Howitzer project now as a big role, and I think gonna have a bigger role even in Turkey's main battle tank project, so on, so on. And once upon a time, a relation which I also valued a lot was Israel. Uh, why non-NATO partnerships work better than NATO partnerships? First, they ask less questions after setting arms when compared to Turkey's Western partners. Second, they they successfully compartmentalize uh, you know, political differences and defense industry uh, flowing. And, and third, they were much more generous when it comes to co-production and technology transfer. Let us not forget the very fact that had Turkey not faced 2001 uh, financial crisis, we wouldn't have been talking about Patriot S-400 or uh, Aster options for Turkey's air and missile defense system right now, because Turkey and Israel were standing inch close from co-producing aero air and missile defense system, and the Israelis were not dragging their feet in, when it comes to co-production. Now, Ukraine is another example of that. Ukraine, just like you know, Israel or, and South Korea, rises as a non-NATO partner for Turkey, who doesn't ask many questions, uh, who is more keen in uh, sharing technology and, and co-producing things, and compartmentalizes uh, uh, ties with Turkey. And I think when it comes to Akinci, it can really work. Uh, it can really work and, and, and it, it remains to be seen, especially the results, but the test results, the combat results, yes, but the test results are promising. And, you know, Motorsip, the Ukrainian uh, company, can be subject to a sale and a sale even to the Chinese uh, in, in, the, in the coming years. But uh, Baikar was so smart to establish a joint venture with Ukrainian counterpart in Turkey, having the majority of the shares and taking the production line in the Turkish principle. So I think it can, it can really work. But it is a, a, a you know, mutually beneficial relationship because Turkey is also now providing armed drones to Ukraine, which can really work uh, well in, in the anti-terrorism operations in the eastern part of the country. I also saw a question in the Q&A uh, addressed to me as to what could be the effects of, uh, effects of the, the, the Ukrainian potential use of a Bayraktar TB2s in the eastern part of the country. I think it can be really promising. We, again, one you know, uh, drawback here. In Nagorno-Karabakh and in Syria and in Libya, the adversary lacked the edge, the competitive edge, in the electromagnetic spectrum. Whereas in, in Eastern Ukraine, we see that the Russians heavily invested in electronic warfare. And you know, the, the, the electromagnetic noise and jamming the level of jamming in use, Eastern Ukraine is really, really uh, you know, tough and, and hard to overcome. Yes, the Turkish drones are now uh, getting uh, satellite communications features, but again, uh, satellite uh, receivers can be jammed to or scooped to. Uh, so with, with the electronic warfare caveat, I think it is, it is uh, promising right now. But Ukraine, in a nutshell, and again, uh, to, 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 to summarize, uh, Ukraine will loom large as uh, a non-NATO uh, option, I think. When it comes to the sensors and the Canadian incident, in, in two sentences, the first sentence is this. Canada, Canada did something like that uh, right after the Turkish <clears throat> expedition in, in Syria. And, you know, immediately then after uh, back down and, you know, re re return to 
uh, providing that uh, that camera uh, to the Turkish drones. Now Canada doing that again. I don't want to sing the official song here, but again, for what Turkey officially sold arms to a to a nation that used these drones against battlefield targets and broadcasted what it hit on the battleground from the Twitter account of its MOD. And, and, and that nation, Azerbaijan, used these drones uh, to recapture its territory that is registered by four different UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, and, and Turkey was not the only provider of those drones to Azerbaijan. Israel was another uh, provider. I really you know, want to better understand what was the the Canadian explanation for taking such a measure against Turkey, but I can definitely say something uh, for, for sure that, uh, you know, for larger subsystem reliance, it is a problem for Turkey. But as to specifically Canada, congratulations, Canada lost the Turkish weapons market forever. All right, so um, I want to turn a bit uh, towards the broader market uh, for a second for Turkey. Um, you know, Turkey has also, we've also seen collaborative relationships between Turkish drone manufacturers and countries like uh, Pakistan uh, with their development, uh, with their work on, on drones. I mean, where do you see uh, these collaborative relationships going and, and potential customers? Again, uh, same question for, as, as I asked Ryan, you know, where are the next potential customers for uh, Turkish drones? Oh, sorry, sorry, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Well, Turkey just entered uh, three very important weapons market. One was Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, you know, uh, is important, as I said, not because of the, the sentimental ties between the two, two countries, but one nation, but because the Azerbaijan unmanned weapon systems uh, market was dominated by Israel, one of the biggest heads of the industry, especially as to these uh, systems. I think it is impossible for Turkey to jump into Azerbaijan's uh, kamikaze drones, loitering munitions market, because by far Israel offers very good options in that. But when it comes to more traditional assets, and if Turkey manages to you know, secure something for Akınca, especially in Azerbaijan, it will be a big catch. I think Azerbaijani market was a good start and it's going to carry on with bigger systems. The, the second uh, promising uh, thing is Aksungur. Aksungur will be an anti-submarine warfare asset. And I know that the Turkish uh, defense uh, elites uh, eyed new markets in Asia. And when it comes to anti-submarine warfare and the Asian weapons market, I think they, they mix up really well together. In Asia, anti-submarine warfare is really something needed. And Turkey already secured some important naval uh, you know, uh, contracts in Asia, like the Pakistani submarine contract, like the Pakistani Corvette contract like the Indonesian Corvette con uh, contract that they're interested in. So I think uh, anti-submarine warfare drones can make it very successfully in, into the Asian markets. Uh, Qatar was, uh, you know, the, the Gulf market that Turkey entered uh, with uh, Bayraktar TB2, with the strained uh, relations in, in, in the Gulf between Turkey, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. I don't think that the Gulf would make it. Uh, but North African countries, you know, Tunisians were close to procure uh, Anka or uh, Tusash, and because of uh, economic problems, they couldn't do that. And I, th I think North African market also can uh, make a good uh, choice for Turkey. Serbia is an interesting and yet another, uh, you know, uh, candidate uh, for uh, Bayraktar TB2. Uh, and Kazakhstan, uh, if, if Turkey can, you know, enter the, the Kazakh market, uh, it's going to be, again, you know, we should see it beyond the, the sentimental ties of the, the Turkic world, because after Azerbaijan, it will be, and after Azerbaijan, Ukraine, it will be yet another catch in the former, so, former Soviet space, uh, which will uh, really be uh, uh, something. Uh, one, just like very to, 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 to uh, Adam Makovsky's question as to uh, the, 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 the Canadian uh, camera, uh, I think I gave the political context here, but as to the technical aspect of, of the question, you know, Turkey Assassin has a solution in that only two kilograms uh, heavier than uh, two kilograms heavier than the, uh, the the original Canadian one, and I don't think that, that the Canadian arms restriction as to the the sensor would make a big difference or a big hardship in in, in Turkish uh, drone warfare, and I, I'm I'm sure Bayraktar uh, anticipated that has enough stocks. And also right after this decision, 
again, as I said, Canada lost Turkish uh, weapons market because this fluctuation uh, discredits a uh, weapons supplier. And the Armenian diaspora and the Armenian voters, you know, their existence, their presence, and their sentiments uh, does not give any any viable any any reliable explanation. A weapons supplier should supply weapons in a stable fashion. Great, uh, Ryan. I want to turn to you with a question about um, uh, the EU reaction that we got from the audience. The question we have from the audience uh, on the EU reaction to the tri Chinese drones operating in uh, Libya. Um, are there has there been any reaction? Do we know uh, what what uh, European officials think about um, about the proximity of, of these Chinese systems to to their borders? So. Thank you for that question. And I, while I can't speak specifically to the response of EU off officials to the situation in Libya, I think it's it's telling the exhaustive report that came out through the UN on the employment and use of drones uh, and, and various military technologies that um, were transferred to Libya to the Libyan battlefield, both from uh, from Turkey origins and and from uh, UAE origins as well on the other side of the battlefield. And I think looking at that. I believe it was over 400 pages documenting the different examples of um, various technologies that have been uh, transferred and the impact that they're having on the battlefield. Um, it, it, it seems that efforts like that to document and make more transparent what's happening on the battlefield, it, at least inform officials to, to more clearly see the impact that drones are having on those battle spaces. And so um, while I can't speak to the EU piece, I think that the attention that the, the UN and other international bodies are placing on these that space um, definitely shows the importance and, and provides officials with the tools to, to make clear decisions. Yeah, thanks. I John, I want to turn a similar question over to you. I mean, you know, obviously, there's a lot of attention in Greece on, on the role that, that uh, Turkish drones are playing in surveillance operations in the Aegean, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, you know, there are several countries in Eastern Europe that have acquisition programs for a drone that could look, look, look a lot like the Bayraktar, a small uh, armed uh, drone, you know, Poland, Czech, uh, the Czech Republic. Um, you know, what do we what do we know about how uh, the European Union is is approaching um, is thinking about uh, the, the proliferation of, of Turkish drones? Yet another very good question. I think it has two answers. Uh, one is a military answer and, and the other one is a political answer. Uh, the, from the military standpoint as to Turkish Greek, uh, you know, bilateral or Turkish Greek a strategic balance of power in, in the Aegean and the dronization of the Turkish Navy, it is an interesting, uh, and if you are looking the things from Athens and if you are looking at the things through the prism of a zero sum game from both uh, capitals, I'd say, uh, which are ironical to NATO allies, uh, technically speaking, yes, that, that can be a, a really real problem for the Greek Navy. Why? Uh, because the as you have mentioned in the very beginning with the Iblit question, uh, dronization is across the spectrum in the Turkish security apparatus and Navy is a part of it. The Turkish Navy is now operating Anka. And you know, in one incident, I think close to the island of Rhodes, uh, the, 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 the Turkish uh, Anka flight scrambled, uh, caused the scramble of uh, the, the Hellenic Air Force jets over the Aegean. Well, if you look at the operational cost between manned systems, between ANCA and a Mirage or an F-16 of, of the uh, Hellenic Air Force or the Greek Air Force, uh, even with the forthcoming uh, Dassault Rafale uh, and the, the, the F-16 Vipers, and the, as the Greece is really interested in F-35s, you know, F-35 takes uh, about $50,000 per hour uh, to operate. Uh, which means that one hour of uh, combat air patrol or a pair of uh, aircraft uh, would be just $100,000. Uh, and if you just compare this through the, the prism of defense economics, each time Turkey flies an unmanned system and, and Greece will uh, scramble a manned aircraft, I think that would be unbearable uh, for, the, for the Greek defense economy to, uh, to, bear this, uh, to, to just like, sustain uh, such a bilateral uh, balance of power. The second issue with the Turkish Navy, and I think militarily, uh, again, militarily, uh, an alarming uh, thing uh, for Turkey's competitors will be the future of Turkey's forthcoming uh, amphibious assault vessel. 
e, TCG Anadolu based on the, the Spanish Juan Carlos Juan class. Uh, because of the problems uh, and uh, problems emanating from the S-400 procurement and exclusion of Turkey from the F-35 uh, program, uh, the, the, the idea of embarking an air wing of F-35Bs by an additional procurement to the existing F-35As uh, and to embark this air wing uh, on the, 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 the west of TCG Anadolu uh, is not possible right now. Uh, and the, the alternative to F-35B in, in the market is F-35B. There is no other alternative. Uh, the Harriers are retired. No other nation can offer something uh, viable uh, because this is an LHD. This is not an aircraft carrier. So there is no other alternative. So the, the, the Turkish way forward, as we understand from both President Erdogan's speeches and the Turkish uh, defense industry's leaders, is that, that that TCG Anadolu will have an air wing of unmanned systems. And now Turkish companies are working really hard uh, to, to modify the existing drones and to create an, uh, an air wing uh, to embark on TCG Anadolu or made of manned systems. Well, you know, uh, looking at the trends in the, in the, in the uh, air power and air warfare, one could say that as to air-to-air -air combat, that would not work. But again, it, rocket sun comes into the play here and Turkish smart munitions, especially beyond visual range munitions first. And second, the sensors that will equip these systems, including ISA radars, uh, active electronic phase array radars, scan array radars, and, uh, and other sensors. I think the, the, the TCG Anadolu's unmanned air wing is a big question mark right now. And it can really, you know, make a difference. And finally, as I mentioned, we'll not just, you know, repeat what I said, but Aksungur and the, the unmanization or dronization of Turkey's uh, anti-submarine warfare uh, capabilities. This is really something. When it comes to the political uh, side of the coin, I would disagree with the, the, the military analysis that I just uh, voiced uh, two, 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 two seconds ago. Uh, because Turkey is a NATO nation. Uh, and you know, what was the, 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 the basic uh, discussion in the room when we are talking in, in, in Brussels about the future of the Atlantic Alliance, that the allies are not investing in their defense modernization enough, that you know, they are not taking care of themselves enough. And we have a NATO nation that has the one of the, if not the, if not the first one, one of the most successful drone programs of, of, uh, of the uh, Transatlantic Alliance. Uh, so here, I think, again, from the political side, uh, let me ask you or the audience or the, list, or, 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 or the, or the uh, listeners of this conference later on when it is broadcasted uh, from YouTube, uh, why a French president is perceiving uh, more threat and getting more uneasy with the Turkish foreign deployments in Libya, uh, and, uh, and he is not that uneasy or that, that, you know, like anxious or worried about Wagner presence, which has organic ties with the, with the GRU, with the uh, Russian uh, uh, military intelligence. Uh, likewise, I see many European nations are so frustrated and so worried about Turkish presence in Syria, but I didn't see them really being very vocal about the Lebanese Hezbollah or the Iranian revolutionary guys. So looking at the things politically from Turkey, I, 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 it, it is hard for us to explain why Europe is that silent about the Iranian Revolutionary Guard's presence in Syria, or France is so silent about the Wagner presence in Libya, and they are so vocal about the Turkish presence. And I think it is not helping to rejuvenate uh, the, the, the strategic ties between Turkey and its tradition levels. Yeah, I think uh, drones, if anything, are always a bit of a lightning rod uh, when, it, <laughs> when it comes to international affairs. Um, uh, Ryan, uh, we have a question um, from Glenn who asks about uh, the uh, the use of drones on by both the the, uh, the GNA and the LNA, uh, the Bayraktar TB2 on one side and the Wingland Tune on the other. Um, what, what can you say about uh, their... Uh, the the ways that both sides employed uh, these systems, um, and obviously they they both represent a, a big difference in in size and capability. Um, but um, what do you, what can you tell us about you know how they were used in in that conflict um, against each other, if possible? Sure, Dan. Um, well, 
I, I have also, I've, I've seen reports of the uh, drone on drone uh, engagements there, and I, I can't add much in terms of the texture there. I know looking specifically at the, the different capabilities, obviously um, you're, you're talking about two different capability sets with um, the wing along with a, a little bit more um, pr to offer on pretty much every metric. Um, but I think, you know, when you look at the way that the, these different capabilities are employed, um, there are some similarities that come up across the spectrum when you're talking about drone warfare. So uh, the ability to disrupt operations, the ability to uh, harass, to uh, affect supply lines, to um, affect hard targets, um, those capabilities, um, drone capabilities affect those mission sets most directly. Um, and what, cap what drone system you have um, really helps to inform just how, how far you can go in that respect. Uh, uh, drones, uh, you know, it's interesting, John said mentioned earlier that the, 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 the quote about the era of the tank is over. Um, and I think to the point um, that of that quote, uh, you know, it's the high expense, um, hard target available uh, for, for drone strikes, uh, it, obviously that utility um, is put into question right now by the proliferation of drones, by um, the advent of, of different new uh, technologies on the battlefield. But at the same time, drones are not able to hold battle space. They're not able to hold territory. Um, and so when you look at how it's employed on the battlefield, there is, is clear uh, advantages for disruption, for uh, attriting a, a force's resources. But in terms of holding territory in terms of advancing, um, you know, uh, a position, it, it's a little bit more limited. And so, so sort of looking at the way that they've been employed uh, in that battle space, I think that you see both the strengths of the various systems uh, of, of, and of the drone usage in general, but then also the, that distinct limitation and that while these harassing activities are going on and this destruction is taking place, um, battle lines only shift when the territory is held by folks on the ground. And so that's that's sort of the the strengths and the weaknesses of that approach right there. Yeah, I think you know um, John uh, mentioned the great scud hunts uh, in in the Gulf War, and I think you know it, it, in a way what we saw in Nagorno Karabakh harkens back to the the limitations and the advantages of air power that we see um, uh, that we saw in the Gulf War and, and, and in conflict since. Um, John, I have another question about you for you on um, on the. The, particularly the Akinji, uh, you know, the typical munition for a drone has been uh, the Hellfire style anti-tank at a ground guided missile. Um, that hasn't changed uh, largely as drones have proliferated uh, to China. We have the um, uh, similar missiles uh, being being uh, used by China, the FT-8C and so on. Um, but the Akinji proposes a, a whole range of munitions much broader than we've seen in other countries. I mean, what can you tell us about how the, the Akinji could uh, change the, um, the dynamic for, for drone, armed drones for broadly and specifically for the Turkish military? Well, thank you. And again, I'd like to just you know, revisit what it's gonna come with that Akinji will be a real beast, really. It, it's, it's, it will be able to carry a, what we call SOM missile, uh, which is the indigenous cruise missile of Turkey. Akinji will be able to carry its uh, first initial variant. Uh, there will be a, uh, there is even a, a variant for F-35, uh, SOMJ, which, you know, uh, came to nothing uh, with the explosion from the F-35 project. But the initial variant of the, the missile, uh, SOMA, Akinji will be able to carry it. And with, with this air launch cruise missile with more than 200 kilometers range, I think it will be a deep strike asset. So what, what, what could it do that Turkey could not do, for instance, up until now? Uh, very tangibly speaking, you recall back in 2012, a Turkish F-4 Phantom jet, uh, it was an electronic intelligence variant, was shut down by the Syrian air defenses at the time. And Turkey initiated Article 4 of the, uh, of the NATO alliance and asked for you know, more interventions approach from its allies. Uh, and this disappointment was a different story, but had we, face something like that with Akinji in the inventory and being able to launch cruise missiles without entering into the engagement envelopes of the Turkish or the Syrian air defenses, I think uh, Turkey would have uh, Turkey would have targeted some advanced SAM sites of the Syrian Arab Air Force uh, from the Mediterranean uh, with Akinji, for instance. Uh, secondly, 
uh, had Turkey uh, operated something like Akıncı uh, when uh, the Tripoli forces uh, were preparing to march to uh, Sirte and Jufra, and you know uh, even the the communications uh, department of the Turkish presidency uh, were was talking about the the the, the necessity to march to Sir Sirte and Jufra at the time. Well, Bayraktar TB2 comes with 55 kilograms of payload and Akınca comes with uh, over one ton of payload, which includes uh, joint direct attack munitions, like uh, once dump bombs, now uh, smart bombs, uh, thanks to the guidance uh, kits uh, made by the Turkish uh, indigenous uh, defense industry. I think it could have been a game changer had Turkey operated something like Akınca in these operations. Again, it boils down to one thing that I mentioned and uh, Ryan uh, very wisely, I think, elaborated, that these assets are best used or would produce more tangible results in the battleground if they are used as a part of combined arms warfare. So let's look at the Azerbaijani uh, experience with that. It was, the, it was the debate in the town in Turkey, whereas Azerbaijan was scoring only tactical kills and tactical success with these drones because they were, you know, broadcasting videos of exploding Armenian tanks, but the, the, the map was not changing in the first weeks of the in the first weeks of the Azerbaijani campaign. But let's look at what Azerbaijan achieved in the following weeks. Azerbaijan was not able to fly Skoy 25s attack aircraft, but in the in the in the coming weeks, in the, in the later uh, episodes of the war, Azerbaijan was able to fly them. Why? Because over the two three weeks course. Uh, the Azerbaijani drone warfare assets eliminated more than 60 mobile SAM systems and two S, S, at least uh, two uh, S300 uh, strategic SAM systems. And it paved the ground or more marginal money for manned aircraft to find more permissive uh, airspace. And again, you know, having destroyed uh, Armenian uh, armor in hundreds, uh, infantry fighting vehicles, main battle tanks, and also fires like howitzers, like uh, multiple launch rocket systems, it, I think, enabled the Azerbaijani ground troops to speed up their operational tempo and change the map. So thinking that Akınca is bringing something, you know, tenfold of the firepower, of the brute firepower uh, that, that, uh, that uh, Bayraktar has brought to the, the battleground up until now, I think uh, jointly used by, uh, by uh, jointly used with a combined arms warfare units, Akinji will be a, a, a speed, a speeder, uh, or a, a, a force multiplier in terms of operational tempo. And Akinji can make something that Bayraktar, you know, within within a week, that Bayraktar would take, you know, two three weeks because of this overwhelming firepower. It will enable what to the to the operators of Akinji. It will enable it will enable a window that can politically be best used because thinking about the political pressure on Azerbaijan or political pressure on Turkey in its uh, Syria expeditions, I think like a like a time machine, uh, the overwhelming firepower of Akinci will provide uh, uh, will, will provide a huge operation, a really fast and really overwhelming operational tempo that would make any campaign more immune to political pressure because the ground troops and combined arms warfare units will have you know, more to rely on to finish the job in a, in a smaller, in a, a more uh, summarized uh, window in, uh, in, in a framework. Uh, the big thing, if it can, if it can make such a, 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 an achievement, will be an air-to-air -air warfare score. Remains to be seen. With, within visual range munition from a military standpoint, I don't think it, it is realistic. But with beyond visual range, you know, uh, munition, who knows? After all, this is just a smart missile flying. Be it launched from a uh, SCOE uh, 25, F-16, or Akinji. If the missile is beyond the visual range, and if the target is not that, you know, uh, not, not that robust, if it is a Soviet legacy aircraft uh, that the Syrian Arab Air Force is flying, for instance, or if it is SCOE 25 that the Armenian uh, Air Force is flying, uh, with beyond visual range munition launch from Akunja, I would say why not? This is not beyond imagination.
No, I, I mean, I, I agree. And, you know, uh, over to, uh, to you, Ryan, a, a sort of similar question. Um, you know, we regularly see uh, the Wingland Toon being displayed at air shows with a, a whole range of, a whole, you know, 15 set of, of, uh, of munitions. But in actual experience in Libya, you know, we've only seen the Blue Arrow 7 missile, I think, being used. Um, I mean, is there... Uh, is this something that the, the PRC is learning from operations in Libya about developing larger, more robust systems that can carry more diverse set of munitions? And also another trend I think and we see in, in the Chinese market is smaller armed drones, you know, the, the lightweight size uh, that are not disposable like, uh, like the uh, loaded munitions, but are actually um, uh, can, be, can be equipped with a variety of small munitions. Can you talk a little bit about um, the, the variety of, of uh, Chinese armed uh, drones that we're seeing and, and the munitions that we see? Sure, Dan. And building off something John said, I, I think one thing that I'm, I'm learning a lot about here is just the way in which the Turkish industry and the um, uh, direct involvement in these conflicts has fed uh, that development of operational concepts. Um, and I think when you compare the Chinese and Turkish experience of employing armed drones, the Turkish have a much more direct line into how drones are employed as part of a an interstate conflict or a more um, actor versus actor conflict ra rather than an insurgent type scenario uh, within a state. And so I think when, while Turkey's deriving a lot of lessons about uh, that battle space and, and you know, the, the penetrating uh, benefits or being able to puncture certain elements of a layered defense to open up for, to, to create more permissive airspace for other elements. I think that some of those, um, those lessons are more difficult for uh, Chinese leaders and the Chinese military to learn when uh, simply involved in, in the arms sales from a distance. Um, and so that's an interesting distinction, just listening to John work through those operational concepts. But in terms of the, the technology side, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear that both in terms of um, the, the flight ceiling, in terms of payload capabilities, Chinese assets right now um, it fall well short of the U.S. assets that, that they're they're often touted as comparable to. Um, looking at the CH-5, it marked um, you know, a, a pretty dramatic jump up in terms of payload capability. Um, but at the same time, the, the ceiling limitations are still very real. And also uh, it, it hasn't been pushed out for export at this point. So um, I, there's been interest and there's been conversations about um, those sales, but at this point um, it has not hit the battlefield in the Middle East or North Africa. And so looking at that investment in payload, it, it's, I think it's acknowledged as, as a shortcoming, um, but whether or not uh, China's main battle systems end up being able to deliver um, on that, that trade-off uh, remains to be seen. And I think looking at, at different ways in which the, that those technologies are influencing the battle space. And um, when you take something, uh, China you know, is, uh, for example, looking at the Israeli Harpy style um, anti-radiation drone, and you know the the AS9, uh, ASN 301 um, is, is something comparable that in those operational concepts um, you could see that be playing a key role in opening up airspace for less capable systems or more vulnerable systems um, as, as you know the Chinese forces or their partners end up trying to shape that battle space. And so looking at the different ways to mitigate those shortcomings in terms of the engine development, in terms of the payload capability, um, uh, those. Those shortcomings are very are real, um, and whether or not China is able to mitigate them um, kind of remains to be seen. Great, I think we're running up on our time. Um, I just want to close out with a question, I guess, to both of you. Um, is uh, this may be too long of a question, but um, we've seen uh, Turkey approach, you know, the use. We've seen Turkish drones encounter. Um, uh, Russian-made anti-air air defenses on, on multiple battlefields now. Um, can, can you leave us with any thoughts, both of you, on, on the role that drones can play against in conflict against peer or near-peer competitors? Uh, is, is Ryan, is China sort of taking the same lessons away from uh, these conflicts about uh, how drones can be and cannot be used in, in conflicts where there are uh, significant air defenses? Yeah, it, it, that's a, a great question to close on. I, th I think when you look at um, the, the way that China is approaching the battle space right now, first off, the way that uh, China probably has a more creative approach to drone utilization domestically and further afield than, than any other country out there. I mean, we've seen through COVID, we've seen through the agricultural sector, all the civilian uh, use cases for drones, but also in the battle space, I think there's a very 
uh, real recognition of the role that drones can play in terms of maintaining situational awareness, in terms of degrading air defenses, in terms of um, integrating um, communication and, and acting as sort of relay. Uh, and then the, the swarm technology uh, as well is um, a big part of the direction that Chinese doctrine and investment uh, seems to be shaping that battle space. Um, in terms of a, a, a peer competition, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say specifically how, um, how Chinese employment of drones would shape that space, looking at, um, looking at the way that they've been employed to date um, in exercises and elsewhere. Um, I think in that, I mean, there is a very clear recognition, sort of what John and I both spoken to about the fact that drones are an impressive capability, but limited in what they can accomplish, particularly on a battlefield against an adversary that in which there is an exchange of territory or, or there is a, a defensive posture even. And so um, I think uh, as China continues to integrate drones into their battle concepts, we'll continue to see them find ways to uh, target key, key uh, communication nodes or, or situational awareness nodes of an enemy or to leverage drone technologies um, to navigate that electromagnetic spectrum and um, find ways to degrade an uh, adversary connectivity and situational awareness and uh, protective measures. Thanks so much, John. Any closing thoughts from, uh, from you? Well, I uh, completely agree with what Ryan said. From a different angle, I would say, uh, as to the future of drone warfare and you know the, the cat and mouse game, whether it's going to favor the cat or the mouse, I think we should look at the, it, whether it is an offense dominant drone warfare, whether it is an offense dominant regime or a defense dominant regime. And that's a very tricky point because we know that ballistic missile warfare, for instance, especially when tipped with uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, warheads, payloads, uh, nuclear, biological, and chemical, it is definitely an offense dominant regime. You just launch a salvo of 12 missiles, the, the adversary intercepts 10 and just two lands with WMD warheads, the, the job is done. Whereas amphibious warfare, for instance, is a defense dominant regime. You can just like hold ground with limited defensive force, uh, even when you are facing a, a major offensive force. The, the tricky part as to drone warfare is that it becomes an offense dominant regime if the adversary lacks enough capability in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, whereas it becomes a defense dominant regime if the adversary is, is really you know, making a good progress in the electromagnetic spectrum. So to, to predict the future of drone warfare, I think we should look at other areas uh, that, that incorporates into the broader uh, drone warfare uh, environment, I would say especially with counter drone uh, technologies, electronic warfare uh, technologies, and, and, and the capabilities to produce a more and more accurate and more and more real time the uh, air picture. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the, the students and the analysts of this, uh, of this area, like you, me, and, and the, the attendees of this conference, I think this is a good uh, analytical guidance for us. Uh, to, to predict, to anticipate the future of drone warfare. But right now, uh, as we are speaking, uh, especially against the adversaries that lack the, 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 the edge in electromagnetic spectrum, and especially when used as a force multiplier uh, with other aspects of the battlefield, that's really a game changer. That's great. That's a great place to end on. Uh, thank you so much uh, to both of you, Ryan and John. I uh, really loved your piece, reading your pieces. And if anyone hasn't checked them out yet, they can be uh, viewed on the Jamestown Foundation website. Um, if Glenn is still here, I don't think he is. So I'll just uh, close out. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, and I look forward to continuing the discussion offline. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great. Uh, Great discussion here. Uh, very much appreciate your moderating this, Dan, and we're, we're, we're ready to move on to the next panel. Uh, and so I think this has been by far one of the most interesting panels this week uh, that we've had and, and appreciate all your participation. I've certainly enjoyed it and extremely rich uh, and fruitful. So uh, our next panel, uh, as we segue in, is going to be on militant movements in Sahel uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and beyond, and I'm going to turn the floor over uh, to our host, uh, who seems to have lost his razor. So, uh, <laughs> our moderator is, is Uncle Ted. So, anyway, we thank you. Ted, the show is yours, and uh, take it away. Thank you, sir, very much. I welcome all of you to this session 
uh, where we're going to be looking at militant movements in Africa and across its unique geography. We have three extremely talented analysts uh, for you today to listen to who will be covering various segments of the African continent. I'm not going to uh, delay that anymore. Each uh, person will have approximately 10 to 15 minutes for their presentation, uh, followed by Q&A from everyone involved here. So without further ado, we'll we be starting with Jacob, followed by Dario, and then followed by Brenda, as it is on the uh, schedule. So Jacob, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ted. It's really a pleasure to be speaking uh, with you as the moderator and alongside Brenda and Dario. I'll be talking about the Sahel and Nigeria and the jihadist groups there. Now, in keeping with consistency across the panels at this e-conference for Jamestown's Terrorism Watch Week, uh, I noticed that you know, Bruce Hoffman and Michael Ryan discussed on the first day the issue of ISIS, Al-Qaeda reconciliation, and whether something like this could happen. And both of them thought that it was possible, but it was certainly not imminent. And the signs from the Sahel and Nigeria also indicate that it could be possible, but it's clearly not imminent. Now, it's well known amongst watchers of jihadi groups that until the beginning of this year, in other words, at the time of Jamestown's conference on terrorism last year, when we were all able to meet in person, in the Sahel, the Islamic State in Greater Sahara and the Group for Supporters of Islam and Muslims, otherwise known as JNIM, J -N -I -M, which is the Al-Qaeda group in the Sahel, they were more or less getting along. But by the end of last year, Islamic State in Greater Sahara, or ISGS, was really on the upsurge. It had carried out major barracks raids in Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso. And into the beginning of this year, it became apparent that the ISIS loyal group in the Sahel was beginning to become stronger than JNIM. And this is actually very interesting from a terrorism theory perspective, because what happens when a group that was previously weaker, that has a rival affiliation, ends up becoming stronger than the other group? And we quickly saw JNIM crack down on ISGS, and they've done so successfully. So right now, we definitely have a stronger Al-Qaeda affiliate in the Sahel than, the I, than ISGS, and their fighting has actually occurred along multiple fronts, and it's been quite intense. And one of the key triggers of this was actually the formal recognition in April 2019 of ISGS as a province of Islamic State. Prior to April 2019, ISGS was considered ISIS's fighters, but it formalized this in April 2019 by merging it with Islamic State in West Africa province, which we otherwise know of as Boko Haram. Now, Islamic State West Africa province operates in Nigeria, Niger, Cameroon, and Chad. And although it's not talked about much, there is an Al-Qaeda loyal group in Nigeria known as Ansaru. We've written about it for Jamestown several times over the years. But what's not known is that ISWAP has encountered Ansaru, the Al-Qaeda group in Nigeria, and they kill them when they find them. So the reason why we don't talk much about Al-Qaeda contesting ISWAP in Nigeria is in part because ISWAP actively kills them. And this is also uh, important because there was a chance of accommodation between ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Nigeria, despite Al-Qaeda being smaller. Uh, but in around March, 2019, ISWAP underwent a leadership shift. And the result of that leadership shift was that the former leader, Abu Musa Balbarnawi, was deposed and more hardliners came into power. Now, I suspect that ISWAP's more aggressive leadership was promoted by Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, in part because in the beginning of 2019, ISIS began to see that on the horizon, it was going to lose its territory in Iraq and Syria and it needed very hardline, very committed leaders of its provinces to make sure they wouldn't abandon ISIS in its time of need. And what we have seen clearly in Nigeria and the Lake Chad region 
is that ISWAP's new leadership has been firmly committed to ISIS through thick and thin, despite al-Baghdadi's death. So for anyone who's wondering about if al-Baghdadi's death has had an impact on loyalty to ISIS from, from Nigeria, ISWAP, no, no impact, complete loyalty is still there. Same with the Sahel, ISGS, which, which as I mentioned is formerly ISWAP, it's still there. And as Brenda will discuss, for all that we can see, the commitment to ISIS is there in Mozambique and Congo. So there is no AQ ISIS reconciliation on the horizon, but it's relevant to note that there were times in the recent history of these groups where such could have been possible. So that means that there could be shifting dynamics that make it possible in the future. Now, in terms of the strategic orientations of ISIS and Al Qaeda, I think everyone's sort of familiar with how ISIS tends to be more hardline than Al Qaeda towards uh, Muslim civilians and whatnot. And that generally holds with the ISIS groups in Africa. Uh, but what I think is really important to look at in terms of the Al-Qaeda ISIS dynamics in the Sahel is that JNIM is clearly putting itself on a path to one day negotiate with either the Malian government or perhaps some international mediation on the condition that France remove itself from the Sahel. And I don't think that we should ignore that that is very similar to the conditions that the Taliban is putting on negotiating in Afghanistan, basically saying we want the US out and then we'll talk to the Afghan government. And in theory, they'll come to some agreement on releasing prisoners and, and, and a truce. But in theory, I think what the Taliban wants is a 1975 Saigon moment where they actually take Kabul. And I think when you keep in mind that JNIM is loyal to the Taliban, you can see that the Taliban is leading the way for how a group like JNM can see some type of path to victory where they're allowed some territory and they're allowed Sharia and they're allowed governance. And this is also relatively consistent with what we see in Syria where the Al-Qaeda groups there try to quasi break from Al-Qaeda, try to deal with international actors and you know, we're willing to engage the international system. So I think that's important because in contrast to JNIM and the Taliban model, you know, ISIS considers that to be apostasy. And we see no sign of negotiation at all from the Islamic State actors in Africa. And that would include ISWAP. And in fact, two of the most notable strategic shifts of ISWAP since the leadership change occurred in March 2019 were one, that it began to target international aid organizations as well as aid organizations in Nigeria itself and either kill those aid workers or uh, ransom them off, which is clearly an indication that you're not willing to engage the international system. And they, they began targeting Christians, which was something that the previous leadership had not done so much. So uh, when we look at these different dynamics, I think the, the biggest ideological difference is about international engagement. I also think if we really wanna hone down on the strongest group in Africa right now, which I think is ISWAP, again, popularly known as Boko Haram, we see a major strategic challenge for the Nigerian army that I think someone who would study insurgency anywhere in the world would recognize. The Nigerian army since the middle of 2019, and keep in mind that was just a few months after this leadership shift where ISOP became more hardline. In mid 2019, Nigeria went into the super camp strategy. Now we've seen more than one and a half years of that. And what happened is Nigeria is bunkered down in very big bases covering the major towns of northeastern Borno State. But the countryside is largely ceded to ISWAP, all parts of Borno State. And ISWAP is dominating the roadways. And it's because it's dominating the roadways that it can capture these aid workers uh, and that it can go into villages and attack Christians and that it can really cut off the towns from the countryside and therefore it can recruit relatively freely. And so this is a classical you know, insurgency, counterinsurgency campaign. And over time, it doesn't really work out well from the counterinsurgency perspective. And we only see ISOP getting stronger and being very deliberate about you know, increasing its capabilities and conducting ambushes. So I don't think Nigeria can really keep on this way for many years. There's a basic stalemate, but at, at some point they're gonna need to reconceptualize what they're doing. And the fact that they rely on the Air Force to attack ISWAP is probably not enough. There are air uh, airstrikes on ISWAP or the, the more, even more intense faction uh, led by Abu Bakr Shakao, 
but the airstrikes are just not enough to, to root out the insurgents uh, strategically. So, so that's a major challenge that Nigeria is facing. Uh, lastly, before I close out after this you know, initial brief, and of course we can go into Q&A uh, you know, later in this panel, I, I think it's worth talking a little bit about uh, geopolitical actors and some new faces on the scene that we might be seeing in the future. We've, we, we just talked about drone warfare in the panel before this, and I do think it's relevant to note that you have a more assertive Turkey in North Africa, and that's something that Daria will talk about next. Uh, Russia is obviously involved in North Africa. You see Russia very involved in uh, weapons sales to uh, countries like Niger or even weapons provision. They don't even need to charge. You also see Turkey establishing the same type of agreement to support Niger that it already has with Somalia. And as Chan who spoke in the last panel wrote in Terrorism Monitor, you know, Turkey is very invested in Somalia. It doesn't mean Turkey will become as invested in Niger, but you might have other actors on the scene that can bring new capabilities, new ideas of counterinsurgency. And I do think it's relevant to note that Turkey and France are rivaling each other in certain different spheres. And you know, France obviously views Mali, Sahel, and Niger as its sphere in the Sahel, but, it, but the insur counterinsurgency is not particularly effective there. So over time, after five or 10 years, will countries like Turkey or even Russia try to you know, amplify their presence in the Sahel through the means of counterterrorism? That's something I think we, we should look at in the Sahel. I don't expect that in Nigeria, simply because Nigeria is still very adamant about its sovereignty, despite struggles against ISWAP and Boko Haram. And, and it's something that we might eventually see in Mozambique as countries begin to ponder who's gonna support Mozambique stifle an insurgency that right now shows no signs of abating. So on that note, I will turn it over to uh, the next panelist. Thank you very much, Jacob. That was excellent and very insightful, especially bringing in the foreign actors that are coming into the region now, how that affects the counterinsurgency landscape. It's very important given what happened in Mali before, then we go up to Armenia and Azerbaijan, lessons learned, Libya lessons learned, and it comes back. Speaking of Libya and outside actors, we're gonna now move to Dario, who will be talking about Libya and the uh, actors that are involved there for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> thank you. And uh, so it's always good to, to be uh, with, the, with the Jamestown for, for this important event. Also this year, uh, it's uh, in, a, in a very, uh, different um we are doing this in a in a slightly different way than than the past yes as uh, i think on on this we can actually build up on what we said last year about the return of uh, uh, states as crucial actors in shaping the security dynamics in North Africa. Um, last year, we were discussing uh, about the emergence of Turkey as a major player in, in Libya after the two memoranda that Ankara signed with the, with the GNA at the end of November. Um, it was still unclear at the time whether Turkey could have been effective in its uh, action in support of the GNA and has the dynamics have shown this uh, over the past few months, Turkey was extremely effective in, uh, in supporting the GNA forces against, um, in resisting the military offensive from, from the, um, the Libyan National Army and, and Khalifa Haftar and, um, and we noticed that there is this interesting uh, um, aspect of the Turkish involvement in the region, which is made of uh, military um, support and using instrumentally some of the groups of Syrian fighters that Turkey has, uh, has supported over the years in Syria. And, uh, and uh, has used them both in Libya and uh, in, uh, also in, um, in, the, 
in the case of the Nagorno-Karabakh, as we have seen um, in, in recent months. And, um, and the Turkish open military intervention in Libya has actually changed the, um, the, the balance, the military balance on the ground and, uh, uh, and has stopped the after military offensive, uh, bringing, creating the conditions, I would say, for uh, the, um, created the conditions for Libyan actors to discuss and negotiate this permanent ceasefire that um, has somehow stabilized the situation on the ground. Although, and this is something that I think whoever uh, is, uh, has an interest on Libya can notice, uh, cease, the ceasefire is structurally weak in the sense that uh, a very significant number of actors has a not so, uh, let's say, hidden interest in spoiling the process at some point. There have been rumors about the military reorganization of uh, Eastern forces. Um, there are problems existing uh, because we should, and we should not forget that the Libyan conflict these days is part of broader Mediterranean uh, dynamics. And we cannot detach that conflict from the problems that Turkey is facing in the East Med vis-a-vis uh, Greece, Egypt, Cyprus, and, uh, and Israel. Uh, in the past few weeks, there have been a number of interesting dynamics bringing the United Arab Emirates more significantly, significantly in the Mediterranean. Think about the strategic partnership, partnership with Greece. But let's not forget the Abraham Accords as well. And uh, although there is a new administration coming in, I don't really see how a new administration can actually uh, dismantle this, um, um, these accords, because I think it's, it, it's in, the, in the interest of the United States to bring a, as a whole, not only uh, of the Trump administration to uh, bring as many Arab countries as possible um, to establish diplomatic relations with Israel, then the impact on the uh, Palestinian issue, uh, this is not the, uh, the place where we should talk about that. So I will leave uh, this, uh, this issue for another, for another time. But as I said, security dynamics in Libya these days are very much shaped by state actors. And I would say that uh, despite everything, uh, Turkey, Russia, and the UAE represent the most significant among uh, these external actors. Egypt as well has a role, but Egypt is facing a number of, of problems from um, um, inter domestic issues to the economic impact of the pandemic to the problems with Ethiopia and, um, and uh, Renaissance Dam. So uh, on that, I think the capacity of Egypt of uh, uh, intervening in the Libyan context is a little bit weaker than that of the others. And the same could be said uh, about Algeria. There have been a number of changes, the um, constitutional uh, evolution that in theory allows Algeria um, to be more proactive in intervening abroad, although on that, I think that the formal change will, uh, uh, the, the, the Algerians might need years to actually transform this formal change for, to turning into a material change, because I think the appetite for the Algerians to operate militarily beyond um, the borders is still not so Significant, of course, if the situation in the region requires, maybe they might be forced, that's another story. And uh, in, in this picture, since this is a conference on militant movements and terrorist organizations, where these organizations are in the Maghreb, are they still active? Um, tomorrow is 10 years since my first conference with the Jamestown. Uh, I remember 10 years ago, we were discussing about 
the transformation of uh, AQAM from a proper jihadi organization into a sort of narco jihad uh, group uh, driven by Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar and Abu Zaid back in the days. Um, today, the question that we might need to answer is whether AQAM is still a relevant actor in the region. Uh, Abdel Malik Drukdel was killed in, in May by a French uh, force, by a French attack in, in northern Mali. But, I mean, although if he was the longest um, serving jihadi leader across all the Al Qaeda franchises, um, the relevance of the Algerian leadership in uh, shaping uh, uh, even the direction of, of the movement as a whole was um, has declined over the years, as uh, Jacob um, can explain better than me, uh, like the groups linked to Al-Qaeda are way more active and their role is way more significant in the Sahelian belt rather than in, in North Africa. The interesting dynamic um, over of the past two years, I would say, is that in, uh, in, in, in the space of, the, of Mediterranean Africa, excluding Egypt, but Egypt uh, is a bit of, um, of, of a special case. And, and I think we might need the, a single one day conference on that. So I will not dig too much into this case, but we have seen, uh, oh, we have also seen a decline at least from an operational perspective of Islamic State groups in, uh, in North Africa, especially in Libya, a country in which Islam, the, Islamic, the local branch of the Islamic State was actually reorganizing itself after it was dislodged um, by Misrata forces in, um, uh, in, um, in, in Sirte. And um, there were these three AFRICOM uh, uh, airstrikes in September 2019 that actually it seemed that reduced significantly the, the capacities of the organization. And why there has still been some, some attacks, um, for instance, um, in, in Tunisia near Sus recently, but these attacks are in many cases not so sophisticated in the case of Tunisia, there is this interesting dynamic of local youngsters that are um, trained, uh, not trained, but are groomed mostly online and have almost no operational experience who try to act. Uh, there was this attack from uh, um, uh, carried out by two young guys from a, a, a native of Tunis called Lakram that hit the a police patrol, uh, the, the policemen that um, usually stay in front of the American embassy. In Tunis, there was this other attack in Sus, but apart from this sporadic um, low scale attacks, we have seen that both the Islamic State and, the, and Al Qaeda in, uh, in uh, relevant threat. And uh, I'm concluding here. Does it mean it's over? No. I think Dario is frozen. Uh, is everybody else seeing that Dario is frozen? Yes. Not yes. Okay. Um, I think we're going to move on uh, to save time and we'll come back to Dario after he resets. So, Brenda, if you could please start now, uh, that would be great. Uh, so, Brenda, uh, take it away on Mozambique. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so, uh, I'll begin with uh, Tanzania and what has happened uh, 
in around 2016, which is the year we uh, believe this sort of started happening. So uh, the first Islamic State attack that ever happened in this region between Tanzania and Mozambique was in Mwanza by a group called Jaba East Africa. I suspect that this group may have had links to Al-Shabaab um, because uh, it was mostly active in Somalia. Um, a year later, uh, what happened was the Tanzanian security forces disbanded this group and uh, members of this group split between um, the DRC and um, Tanz in Mozambique. Now, this is where we see the connection between um, the Islamic State Central African uh, province and uh, Ansar Suna in Mozambique. Um, so literally two months later, after the Tanzanian forces had disbanded uh, Jaba East Africa, we saw the rise of Ansar Suna in Mozambique. Now this group has since um, instigated increasing attacks in Cabo Delgado um, that has displaced um, almost uh, uh, half a million people. So uh, currently the region is facing a huge humanitarian crisis of note, and some of it is spreading into Tanzania. What is also spreading into Tanzania is also attacks by this group on Sosuna. Um, as you can, as you remember, I just said that parts of um, Jaba East Africa did enter uh, Tanzania, so we're likely to see uh, continued attacks into Tanzania by this uh, particular group. Um, in 2019, what we saw was uh, the Islamic State Central African Province pledge allegiance to the Islamic State. And this was when um, Ansar Suna, um, uh, the Islamic State Central African province began claiming attacks in Mozambique. So we can see some sort of coordination between um, the Islamic State Central African province and what is happening um, in Mozambique. Now, it's worth noting the fact that uh, since um, some of the elements of Juba East Africa and Ansar Suna has ties to Tanzania and uh, Kenya and Somalia, we're seeing parts of mem uh, particular individuals of these nationalities in Mozambique. Um, and this sort of explains sort of the transnational factor that we're seeing at play. Now, the capabilities of the group is quite unique to the region. We have not seen anything like this uh, before. Um, this uh, insurgent group has the capacity to hold various towns and is instigate attacks almost simultaneously um, distracting security forces moving from one place to the other. They're highly coordinated and they um, operate in cells and communicate that way. Um, so at the same time, they have um, capitalized on uh, the fact that there is distrust between uh, government security forces, um, local militia groups, um, and the police. This is a big factor that is hindering um, uh, counterinsurgency efforts in northern Mozambique. So, um, so what happens is that they've adapted certain strategies to sort of confuse government security forces and local militia. For example, some of the tactics that they use is wearing government security forces to uniform. And um, as a result, when uh, the government security forces move in, um, they get confused and they um, uh, open fire on each other instead of the insurgents. Um, at the same time, local militia groups are um, not easily identified by government security forces. So when they're supposed to be working together, they're not working together. In fact, um, fire is opened on local militia groups. And uh, so there is a lot of confusion and distrust among uh, stakeholders that are supposed to be working together. Um, so the insurgents do capitalize on this uh, sort of distrust. Um, so. In terms of um, the insurgent group and the Islamic State, um, we sort of really need to see the group uh, show up or pledge allegiance to the Islamic State to know where this group stands. At the moment, the group does identify or call itself Shabab. That is uh, what its uh, spray paints on um, infrastructure has damaged. Um, just a few days ago, they went and looted a, a maternity clinic and sprayed Shabab. So that has been something that really confuses a lot of people as to whether this group has links to Al-Shabaab or whether this group has links to the Islamic State. So to an extent, uh, we see some sort of ideological influence and there is some training that um, key leaders of this group have undergone in Somalia and specifically Al-Shabaab. 
but the group will have to pledge allegiance uh, to the Islamic State to know where this group stands. The last group that actually did that was Jaffa East Africa, and um, that pledge was ignored. And shortly after, you can see they sort of got the, they sort of uh, moved to the Islamic State Central African province and they got the recognition that was seeking in Tanzania. So we're, we're waiting to see whether we're gonna see something like that happen in Mozambique. Um, so this is uh, in, uh, really concerning because the security situation is deteriorating really fast. And uh, without uh, a coordinated regional strategy by the uh, SADC with the Southern African Development Community, um, we, we really do not have any hope of any like solution arising out of the situation. Um, so really it's up to the Mozambican government to take the lead and to um, also inform whether uh, they would want a military intervention currently they are receiving um, uh, support from the DIC advisory group. Uh, they're uh, receiving support from the South African government in terms of um, personnel carry of ve uh, vehicles. Um, so we are seeing some sort of, but they're very specific as to what kind of assistance they want. They want to maintain control over the counterinsurgency strategy, um, but they, at right now, it does not seem like they really want anyone in. They feel like they have it under control. Um, I strongly don't think that they do, um, so yes, that's that's where I'll end off. Thank you, Brenda. I want to just take a moment here just to ask Brenda a very specific question, uh, and then we'll move to wider questions uh, from uh, our colleagues and the audience themselves. Uh, but Brenda, I wanted to ask you: uh, you're talking about a uh, Mozambique is falling apart uh, very quickly, right? It's falling apart more quickly than some of the other countries on the continent. That's correct, yes? And if so, and you've recommended yeah. some kind of regional response, who should be involved in that regional response? We know that France is, of course, very interested in Mozambique because of its investments there, uh, particularly in uh, energy. Uh, what is this scoped out uh, like uh, from your point of view? How does South Africa fit into this uh, security equation for Mozambique? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't hear the rest of your question. I heard France and then you sort of uh, cut out a bit. Could you just repeat? Yes, I was talking about uh, which outside powers do you think will be able to Come together in terms of a regional uh, response to Mozambique, and how does South Africa fit into the country of South Africa fit into that uh, uh, architecture? Um, well, ultimately, uh, the Mozambican government needs to take uh, charge of uh, exactly what they need. They're the ones who, are on the ground, they understand the dynamics um, at play. Um, also, I'm not uh, very keen on um, a foreign intervention or any other outside intervention uh, getting involved before it's already been established locally within the, uh, with the Mozambican government and the SADC uh, region, what exactly needs to take place. So um, South Africa has a key role to play in this in terms of um, gathering together the uh, SADC uh, members and um, sort of putting pressure on the Mozambican government to establish some sort of strategy, which uh, really hasn't been that sort of pressure uh, when they do gather. There have been at least two summit meetings where they have gathered together and the strategy has not been um, established. So there really does need to be some pressure on the Mozambican government to say exactly what they need uh, from South Africa or Zimbabwe or whatever uh, uh, neighboring states um, so that we can actually end this once and for all. But, at, but the, the, the biggest thing right now is that um, it really is too late. We have reached a level where um, we've reached this three year uh, uh, threshold with this insurgency, where the biggest advantage that we, have, uh, we had over it was time, which was wasted, um, both on a local and a, and a regional level. So whatever strategy is put in place right now, by the time it actually takes effect, is still going to be some time. And by that time, we do not know where uh, this insurgency will be. Uh, uh, currently, right now, uh, the, insurg the insurgents are holding uh, Mosimboya de Praia uh, since August. And if this continues to go on, um, 
it's unclear exactly whether they're going to be able to, they're most likely going to um, exploit this and it's branding um, to establish some sort of like caliphate that people can come and join the group because they're able to acquire territory. And this is something that they've been able to do in various towns. And this has not really sparked the urgency that we need from the Mozambican government or uh, SADC. So, yeah. Great, thank you very much. That was very, very informative. Oh, sorry, my earplug came out. Uh, now we're gonna to turn to Jacob who has a question from the audience and we're gonna follow Jacob with Dario uh, to follow up on issues regarding uh, Russia and uh, its presence in Libya. If you could address that just for a moment because Russia is present throughout the continent. Russia has returned to Africa from where it had been before. So I think we need to consider Russia's place in this equation as well. So Jacob, please go back to that original uh, question that you had brought up. Thank you. So there's, there was a really important question about ISWAP, which is the Islamic State loyal group in Nigeria and the faction led by Abu Bakr Shakao, which we commonly call Boko Haram. And the question was about their, their their historical incentives, their ideologies, and how they're different. So we can say that ISWAP generally follows Islamic State ideology. Uh, one matter where ISWAP has been a little bit different than Islamic State is that ISWAP has taken slaves who are Christian, which Islamic State didn't do. Its slaves were only Yazidis who were, according to them, not people of the book. So there are some different nuances of uh, you know, ISWAP and Islamic State. Now, Abu Bakr Shakao, who leads the other Boko Haram faction, um, which is, he was once the leader of ISWAP, but he was kicked out in part because he was too extreme. Uh, he leads his own faction. In general, Abu Bakr Shakao's faction is in Southern Borno and ISWAP is in Northern Borno and Western Borno. So ISWAP cover, has more range. Uh, but Shakao is actually even more hardline. I mean, he's just a jihadi 100% and he's not going to listen to Al-Qaeda, which is why Al-Qaeda divorced itself from Boko Haram around 2013. And he's not going to listen to Islamic State when he thinks Islamic State is wrong. He, in fact, is so cocky that he thought that Islamic State began enslaving Yazidis because they saw him do it first. So that's why he said he would refuse to take orders from Islamic State, except on media, which is why Abu Bakr Shakao never appeared in any media or uh, you know, his face never appeared in any Islamic State media when he was still the leader. Um, so Shikha is very hardcore into, you know, jihadism, and he, he follows the strict jihadi ideology that anyone would know, but perhaps even more extreme because he considers all Muslims who don't join his group even able to be killed. And he's actually proven to be uh, incredibly resilient. I think one of the advantages that Shikha has compared to ISOP is that ISOP has generated this sort of, you know, global image being part of Islamic State. Shakao, despite viewing himself as a global jihadi, he's really Nigerian at heart. He doesn't really have travel experience. He's not cosmopolitan. He doesn't present this global image. He's actually really, you know, Nigeria born and bred. And I think as a result, he's able to understand the Nigerian situation better. And this is why he's trying to establish affiliate groups in northwestern Nigeria, like Zamfara and uh, Niger State. And even in Cameroon, he established an affiliate group. And even uh, Lake Chad, he established a very active affiliate group that killed 92 Chadians earlier this year. And in fact, he envisions creating his own alternative to ISIS and Al-Qaeda, if I think correctly, but that's just his cockiness. As a practical matter, uh, I don't think Nigeria can really discount the threat from Shakao. However, in terms of the international interests, I think it's certainly ISOP that has more capabilities to do, for example, uh, external operations. But one uh, statistic that I think is important to note is that when you look at Nigerian airstrikes in Borno, it's about 50 percent, 50 percent to Boko Haram and ISOP. So although ISOP is so active in claiming attacks and doing photos and videos like Islamic State provinces do everywhere, it's, it's, it's in fact, uh, from a Nigerian army perspective, I think both of them are about on par for being as dangerous, although we can say that ISOP generally has a leg up. So I'll stop there, but I can certainly do a little bit more Q&A on this uh, later on and even get into Ansaru, the faction that integrates banditry and jihadism in the Northwest, while Dario and perhaps Brenda can discuss you know, Russia, Wagner Group, and China, and other foreign powers in their respective areas of study. Very good, thank you very much. Now we're gonna to move to Dario to speak about a few uh, relevant issues. Thank you. 
Thank you, and sorry for the little uh, technical issue before. Well, um, I think there are two questions on the floor. One is the role of Russia in, in, uh, in Libya, and the other one is why now um, regarding the Algerian uh, shifting approach to use military force beyond its border. Let me focus on Russia first. Actually, uh, the moment Wagner fighters started being present in Libya, um, that was changing the balance of power on the ground in favor of after forces. Why? Um, around uh, September, October 2019, there were reports that this, this uh, fight, these Russian fighters were on the ground in Libya. The, there was a, a huge debate. I think actually I was talking to, to Theodore about this uh, on a conference that we did on Libya together mid-November about actually how many Russian fighters were on the ground. Um, the point is um, uh, that the Libyan conflict, uh, uh, especially um, uh, the conflict of the past, the, the latest phase of, of the civil war was fought by, by local fighters that had very little uh, experience. In many cases, they were, uh, this, there were this group of youngsters from Tripoli neighborhoods that were joining Tripoli militias to fight against after forces, which means that in such a context, even the, the presence of a very small uh, group of uh, experience and well-trained fighters coming from, from other theaters can actually make uh, a difference. This was the case with Russia. Uh, it was indeed supporting after, but I never um, perceived Russia to be so keen on after as many, as other players, for instance, Abu Dhabi. Um, this was somehow, um, um, this was also um, shown by, um, by the fact that uh, when Haftar was losing um, centrality, when it was clear that the military offensive failed, uh, the Russians started uh, checking their options and they were becoming more and more vocal in supporting other actors in Eastern Libya. Um, then, uh, moving to Algeria, I think, as, as I said before, one thing is, is the change on paper, one thing will be uh, a more factual change. I think if, if the question is why now, the, the, there are several elements that we have to take into consideration. First, there is a generational element. element which is the generation that gave Algerian independence is coming to an end for biological reasons. And this uh, approach of non-interference and not using the military option in dealing uh, uh, with conflicts uh, um, uh, outside of Algeria was part of the anti-colonial uh, um, ideology that characterized the, the Algerian leadership after independence. So I think on that, uh, clearly, because there is a new generation emerging, um, they, this new generation might be less and less linked to this, um, to this view, although this is not a change that can happen overnight. Then I think there are also some more circumstantial elements. And more than the, than the Sahel, I think that the Libyan conflict somehow represented a sort of wake-up call for Algeria, in the sense that the Algerian realized that the Mediterranean is becoming more and more militarized, that the military instrument is, is being used in the Mediterranean in its uh, clause of its uh, uh, in in um, uh, in a I don't 
it, it's been used as a, as a way to achieve political goals through military means. This was the case of Russia and Syria. This has been the case of Russia, Turkey, and the Emirates in Libya. And uh, I think that for the Algerians, the idea of, of having a Turkish military presence in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in Western Libya, or eventually, although this was way less likely, having Egypt intervening militarily in, uh, in, in Libya was seen as a potential, like a significant threat. Then whether Algeria can actually use this uh, uh, military forces, this military capacity in support of, um, for instance, groups in, uh, in, uh, across the region uh, in, uh, with the Polisario, for instance, I actually think that this is very, very uh, unlikely, to be honest. Um, I, I don't see how, I think in the case of, uh, of Western Sahara, there have been recently some changes that uh, suggest the idea that, uh, uh, that the mo a significant number of uh, Arab powers are becoming more and more sympathetic with the view of Morocco. And um, I don't really see how Algeria can sustain its, its position vis-a-vis -vis the, the Polisario. Although um, on, on, um, on this, I'm not uh, like a real, real uh, expert. So I, I think someone with a better knowledge of the situation in the Western Sahara can, can say more about this. And in the Sahel, uh, still, uh, I, I think that the Malian instability represent a problem for Algeria, but the appetite for an eventual military uh, action there is even more limited than in other contexts. To conclude, I think that uh, one significant element that pushed the Algerians to rethink about this issue of being uh, of using potentially military forces abroad is what is happening in Libya because Turkey and Egypt represent two potential competitors in the Mediterranean. And from that point of view, especially after the Turkish inter in open military intervention in support of the GNA. Uh, this perception became more and more significant in, in shaping the, the, um, the views of the leadership in Algeria, which uh, I know it's a bit of a deja vu, but given all the problems that, uh, that the President Aboun is, is facing these days, it's, uh, it's, it's clear that Algeria is also uh, facing uh, like uh, an, a further transition within the broader transition that started last year. So on this, and you know how difficult it is to understand the domestic processes in Algeria because of the lack of information, because of the fact that who knows usually doesn't talk and who doesn't know usually talk a lot. So uh, I will stop here for now. Then if there are other questions, uh, we, we can, uh, address them uh, at the end of, of, our, of our conversation. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. That was very insightful, especially about really how the Eastern Mediterranean is about to blow and what is going to happen with Algeria and how it sees itself in North Africa and really what it can achieve militarily in the coming months and years. Uh, Brenda, I wanted to turn to you for a moment because there was a question that came up uh, within the Q&A, and basically it uh, complimented you very much for uh, a brilliant presentation, but the question here has to deal with um, how effective are Mozambique government forces uh, and their specifically their navy against Ansa al sunas uh, maritime capability, uh, the ability to close the port in more uh, sorry in mozambique is really critical for maritime security.
security. What's going to happen in this sphere? How do you see uh, this group as a uh, maritime terrorist, uh, uh, as, a, as a capability in terms of terrorism on the high seas and in ports? Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a very important question because, um, like I said, I, when I began, I uh, talked about this East African corridor that we're dealing with. And um, the, I suspect that the insurgents are using uh, this corridor, um, using borders and also uh, through other means to, the sea, to reach uh, Tanzania, to reach Kenya, to reach Somalia. So this is a very important. Um, this is a very important corridor to secure and to um, build some sort of collaboration among states on this um, East African coast. But what's happening right now is that um, there is no uh, food going to this uh, particular area, Cabo Delgado. The government is really concerned about uh, feeding the insurgents. There are people. There's a humanitarian crisis at the moment. So. Uh, they're also simultaneously uh, preventing food from also reaching people. Uh, also from the Tanzanian side, uh, food has also stopped going to these areas. There are remaining resources that are there. Um, the uh, insurgents are uh, targeting um, displaced people for whatever resources that they still have left. And this has even reached uh, some of the islands off um, the main, uh, uh, off, the, uh, off the coast. Um, so uh, just a few weeks ago, for example, we saw um, the insurgents uh, travel to a neighboring island and um, kidnap about uh, two people and uh, uh, gathered some fish and returned back to Masamboa de Praia, where they've occupied uh, the town. So uh, whatever like uh, displaced people who have fled to these islands, they are at risk of attacks by the insurgent groups. Now, in terms of maritime security, the, the government forces are there. But again, like I said, there's a lot of paranoia um, in that area. So um, in, uh, the uh, displaced persons, uh, when they're traveling to these islands, they're often stopped by security forces and questioned on suspicion that they are insurgents. And it's very difficult for them to um, uh, identify themselves or to prove that they're not insurgents. And there's also like some level of corruption that is going on where uh, the, the refugees that are fleeing to these islands uh, are often having to pay or give up whatever uh, food or, or resources that they have to security forces to just eventually get to the island. So it's a very complex situation. Um, we obviously have to deal with the, the situation of uh, making sure that uh, uh, displaced persons are able to reach the island safely and that security forces facilitate that process, while also um, finding ways in which uh, they can identify insurgents. It's very difficult because they have very specific means of um, confusing the situation. They, they wear uniforms of security forces, they wear ordinary clothes, so it's very difficult to tell. So that is currently the maritime security situation, which is really important, but that's just the state of play. Very good. Thank you very much. That's very insightful. We're going to turn now to Dario for a moment to talk about GNA and Siraj, and then we're gonna uh, go to Jacob to talk more about ports. Uh, Dario? Uh, yes, on, um, on the GNA and, and, and Siraj, yeah, indeed, uh, he announced these uh, resignations that were supposed to be, to come into effect by the end of October. To the best of my knowledge, he's still there. And uh, this has been a quite a common, um, um, uh, this has been somehow like a, a structural element of his uh, period in power. He has always been perceived as extremely weak. He has always been perceived uh, as someone ready to step down from one day to another. And instead he proved to be very resilient. Uh, and Libya watchers, we were a bit skeptical when we read that he was ready to step down by the end of October. Of course, given the ongoing uh, process, uh, maybe it was it was not the best period to, to step down, but still. Um, then when uh, I think the question focused on um, um, whether he was trying to play a game with Turkey. And, and on this point, 
I think we should, uh, uh, there is a tendency on media and uh, among some analysts to see the Libyan um, landscape uh, as, uh, as um, understanding the Libyan landscape through the idea that there are monolithic blocks. Um, like everyone in the GNA is pro Turkey, everyone in the LNA is pro Emiratis and pro Russia. Uh, I think that the situation is way more uh, complex and diversified on the ground. Um, there is this narrative that the GNA is dominated by the Muslim brothers, that's why it's so connected to Turkey and Qatar. I think the reality is way um, less complicated than that. And uh, uh, the, the GNA became so uh, close, became so um, dependent on Turkey because Turkey was the only country that consistently, although with some uh, uh, changes through, through the, through, between September and October last year, it was the only country that showed the willingness to help militarily the GNA. The GNA asked for military help to the US, the UK, Algeria, Italy. No one came to rescue. Turkey instead did so, but it doesn't mean that everyone in the GNA supports the idea that Turkey is the only uh, dominant play, external player in shaping the relationship with the GNA. And we have seen uh, this, um, this dynamic more uh, clearly over the past few weeks with Bashaga uh, trying to talk to Paris, with Maiti talking to, to Moscow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so from this point of view, I think that Turkey is an extremely important and relevant player vis-a-vis -vis the GNA. I think that some elements in Western Libya, like Khaled and Mishri, are very um, ideologically and politically close, uh, are very close to Turkey, but it doesn't mean that there is a unified view within the GNA that Turkey is the only country uh, that, the G that should support the GNA. And I think that if other, for instance, other European countries would show their willingness to engage the GNA uh, militarily, like with, with a significant military support, I think there might be room for some of them to try to diversify uh, their, their, their alliances from this point of view. So I think uh, the situation from this point of view is way more diversified than many observers tend to think. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to move uh, to Jacob uh, to talk more about the maritime scene uh, in uh, uh, West Africa. Thank you. And around Lake Chad as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's uh, interesting to note that if Islamic State has a sort of navy, then what we can say is that its navy exists in Mozambique, which Brenda just discussed, but increasingly in Lake Chad. Now, of course, it's not any sort of formal Navy, but the lake itself is crucial to countering ISWAP and the uh, Boko Haram faction that's there too, on the lake itself. The lake is a huge resource generating uh, area for ISWAP with the pepper trade, the fish trade. I think everyone in the region knows that. And ISWAP can get loads of money from dominating the agricultural and fishing scene there. The lake is also crucial because, as we mentioned earlier, Nigeria is really struggling to combat ISWAP and it needs support from neighboring countries. And Chad is one country that has a fairly effective military and Chad has attempted to patrol part of the lake. But one of the latest trends we've seen is that ISWAP has been de de detonating IEDs around the lake marshlands and it's taken out at least three motorboat canoes of the Chadians in the past few weeks. And ISWAP has put that on its uh, photo and uh, photo imagery. So although ISWAP has already done a great job controlling the roadways for its own purposes, now we see it getting more effective in countering Chad, who's trying to support Nigeria in the marshlands and waterways 
of uh, the lake. And that's going to make it all the more hard for them to combat ISOP. And it's really a new tactical development that we're seeing from ISOP. Uh, more broadly, you know, when we look at the picture in Lake Chad and the Sahel, though, and when I hear what Dario is saying, it's a completely different uh, ball game. The geopolitical stakes in northern Africa right now are, are quite intense in, in the broader Mediterranean. You have virtually all major powers trying to uh, become active there and, as he said, try to establish uh, through military means their political objectives. However, increasingly, I think Lake Chad and the fight against Boko Haram and ISWAP is no longer a uh, you know, global geopolitical imperative. It's really something that Nigeria and its neighbors are leading the way on. This doesn't mean they're not getting support from external powers, but countries like the US are really, you know, have their attention focused in multiple arenas. And I don't think we can expect any major powers to get involved in Lake Chad, but the powers that are there now. In the Sahel, you, you obviously have France, and as I mentioned, potentially Turkey, and the US has done training of, for example, the Nigerians, especially. And you know, on that note, I think uh, we see the limits of counterterrorism in the Sahel. We can see that Drupdil, the Algerian leader of AQIM, was taken out in Northern Mali. About a year before that, we saw Abu Iyad al-Tunisi, a Tunisian al-Qaeda leader, get taken out of Mali. And about a year ago, we also saw Jamal Okacha, another Algerian, get taken out of Mali. So we're seeing that through counterterrorism operations involving either the French or the U.S. or those forces together, uh, we're able to take out the terrorist leaders, which is what counterterrorism does. And uh, we're often able to train uh, counterterrorism operators in these countries to conduct specific operations like hostage rescues. So we're able to do that. And I think that's been fairly effective. But yet the overall trend lines don't indicate that the insurgency is abating. And I think that goes to the dynamics that end up becoming more local than what global counterterrorism can do. And although our training is supposed to uh, facilitate that, now you get into these uh, very local village to village level, you know, diplomacy, uh, familial leaders, clan leaders. And I don't really think that that's something that the U.S. Uh, is necessarily capable of doing. So that's sort of a limit of what uh, we can do in counterterrorism. And it's notable that the Malian leaders of JNIM, like Iyad Agali, has not been taken out, despite that he's actually appearing in public with 200 hostages a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, Hamadou Kufa has not been taken out. And then uh, Adnan Abu Walid al-Sakhrawi, uh, he's, I believe, married to a Fulani a woman from the border area of Burkina and Mali, although he's originally Western Saharan, he has not been taken out. So although it's actually the, the Algerians are becoming more and more removed from the scene in the Sahel, but those who are from the Sahel itself, uh, including leaders and commanders, uh, seem uh, as operationally active as ever. And I think that's something that we have not been able to crack, which is the local level of these insurgencies. And that is a major point <laughs> for the last 20 years of trying to crack insurgencies is what are the local atmospherics that we need to understand as analysts and policymakers about how best to address some of these issues. And I think that's very clear when we look at Brenda's topic on uh, Mozambique because we do not have a good read on the atmospherics on the ground there. And if we want to do a humanitarian aid mission there, we have to understand better exactly how to get the aid in and how to protect it and so on. It begs the question of whether Mozambique is going to be a different model than, let's say, Somalia is or is um, uh, or Mali or something like that. Uh, this is all uh, where we have to look at how all of these insurgencies and so on differ from each other, but they pick up similar TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures that they seem to share or learn online. And I think that's a big factor there. And that turns actually to a question that came up uh, in the Q&A, which is the effectiveness of DOD and AFRICOM ops in the Sahel. And I was wanting to ask uh, the team here, uh, what do you think about AFRICOM and DOD's performance in the Sahel? I know that DOD has been working very hard with Algeria, Morocco, and so on to try to uh, uh, have uh, uh, 
better uh, organizing, training, and equipping for these militaries to fight in a particular way. Um, AFRICOM has done a good job uh, considering what is happening in Libya, uh, but there are many pieces in Libya and trying to get AFRICOM to collect all those pieces together and to sew them up into a nice package uh, tends to take a lot of browbeating. So I think this is an important part of the discussion in understanding the effectiveness of DOD and AFRICOM. Uh, it is effective, but of course, a lot more can be done. Uh, I'll turn it over to my colleagues to uh, make further comments on that issue. Jake? Uh, yeah, sure, I, I can take it uh, first, um, and then I can perhaps hand it to Dario and uh, see if he has any perspectives looking uh, downwards. And uh, I would, you know, re re reiterate um, what I said is that, yes, the U.S. is uh, very involved in training um, and, you know, France is very active on the ground. And I, I think that the training that we have done is fairly effective. Uh, one of the biggest criticisms coming from Washington in the 10 or so years that I've been involved in, in tracking these groups is, you know, human rights abuses, and, and U.S. special U.S. training uh, leading to that, but we haven't seen that type of, uh, you know, issue emerging from uh, the Nigerians or Malians at, at a very severe rate. I'm not saying it doesn't happen at all. Uh, so, so that's one thing that I think we're doing. Um, but, uh, you know, operationally, I think we're also effective. Uh, we have engaged in a number of successful operations like hostage res rescues in border regions. We, we have done a good job, you know, helping uh, countries like France locate where jihadist leaders are and coordinating with Mali and Niger in that respect. So I think, yes, our training is effective in doing what we can do, but I think there are limits to what our counterterrorism training can do. And the limits are that we cannot actually end up getting into negotiations between border communities in Mali and Niger about not letting the jihadists through, especially when the jihadists are intimidating them. This is something that can really only be done by the, the local, the governments there. And uh, I just don't think we have the capability to. So sometime, somehow uh, to extend our objectives, we really need to work with the countries in the region so that they can end up training their local officers and local border region officials to more effectively uh, you know, engage communities where the jihadists operate to engage in the type of diplomacy about not letting the jihadists in, about, you know, providing services and whatnot. Um, and, and I just don't think that that's something that our counterterrorism can do. So I think we're effective for what we can do. Um, but one of the reasons why we still see these insurgencies continuing is that it's, it's not necessarily our fault. The, the means to solve these issues lie in the local governments. And there are many structural factors in addition to issues like lack of accountability that hinder the national governments from actually solving those problems. Very good, thank you. Uh, Dario, do you wanna uh, yeah, have a comment? Yeah, and then maybe, we'll go to Brenda. Maybe not not actually uh, on, the, on the Sahel, but I can comment on the cooperation existing in, uh, with Maghrebi countries because it's uh, it's something on which I'm way more knowledgeable and uh, and I've seen um, I've seen and heard um, things in person and I think as I said if we look at the, at the evolution of the jihadi threat in in uh, Maghrebi countries um, it is way less significant than it used to be and I think part of um, there are several reasons that can explain this, this decline, but I think the consistency of the cooperation between the United States and regional countries is one of the reasons explaining this decline. Then the point is that regional governments, they are not so keen to uh, talk too much about this cooperation first. So it happens, but usually it's not very um, uh, discussed in, in public. Then we um, also over the past four years in which it was clear 
that the Maghreb was not among the priorities of the Trump administration. There was, uh, um, at, at the, uh, I, I always make a distinction between the White House of the past four years and the broader American apparatus. So my, my impression is that the DOD, State Department, et cetera, were consistently um, working to support the counterterrorism capacities of Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, despite the fact that from the White House there were no inputs on, uh, on, um, uh, regarding the Maghreb. And, and I think that from this point of view, the, 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 the level of cooperation is, uh, is good and significant, although it's not something that is usually discussed in, uh, in public. Thank you very much, Dario. And finally, we're gonna wrap up with Brenda's uh, view of this issue. And uh, please take it away, Brenda. Um, I think I will uh, try to bring this uh, down to Mozambique. Uh, uh, Ambassador Nathan Sales was in Maputo uh, not so long ago. And uh, he, uh, to discuss the rising insurgency in Mozambique and he did pledge um, some uh, financial support to uh, help the humanitarian situation. So um, in terms of the US has recognized that the humanitarian situation um, is really serious and um, needs to be front and center in uh, some of the strategies that, uh, that will need to be applied in countering the insurgency. Uh, because the a humanitarian situation uh, creates two uh, severe problems. The first is uh, they provide uh, very easy targets for the insurgents. And secondly, they provide uh, very easy recruits. So uh, at, at the moment, the uh, international response has been towards um, aid. But at the end of the day, like I've always said, local cool intervention needs to be, local and regional intervention needs to be um, strengthened. Um, the US uh, would play a very key role in assisting in capacity building, which is a very uh, important part since um, there, is, there has been some, um, uh, a, a lot of struggle with the uh, government forces and uh, the local police and the local militia uh, in terms of combating these insurgents. It appears that they're way in over their heads. But at the same time, um, a, a really important collaboration would be with other um, uh, countries in Tanzania and Kenya and Somalia because they do have the experience in dealing with these insurgent groups. So uh, I'm very pro uh, local level um, uh, dealing with this and at a regional level, not just at static, but also um, on the East African front, there is a lot of experience to be gained from these groups in the area. So. Um, if if we if uh, uh, everyone is able to come together and um, establish some sort of a strategy that is African led, um, this will be very key to countering this insurgency in a way that we own um, this this effort. Thank you very much, Brenda, for your answer, and I'd like to thank everybody on the panel for. Uh, Excellent session. This was very informative and uh, we'll take a lot away from it. I think a lot of applications to policymaking with new administration. Uh, we're going to have lots of work to do. And so I look forward to further interaction. Thank you very much to everyone and over to you, Glenn. Thank you very much, Ted. Uh, you guys did a great job. It was a very informative panel and I, I think uh, we kept a lot of viewers in, uh, online. Uh, and great interest from all over the world. Uh, I really appreciate your participation. And Brenda, thank you for participating, coming all the way virtually from South Africa. Jacob, uh, you are in uh, Vietnam. Thank you for joining and uh, coming in to Dario. Uh, greetings to everyone in Tunisia. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to note that tomorrow we will have the continuation of the conference, uh, Terror Week, uh, with a panel on Counterterrorism challenges in the Middle East for the next administration. It'll be at three o'clock tomorrow to 4.15 p.m. Uh, our, we have a great lineup with Joel Rayburn, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Levant Affairs. He's now the Special Envoy for Syria, replacing James, Ambassador James Jeffries. 
Uh, we also have Seth Jones, who's uh, uh, director of the Transnational Projects at CSIS, and Professor Bruce Hoffman, Georgetown board member, uh, and others. So look, we very much appreciate your participation, and we'll see you online again tomorrow. Everyone stay safe. Happy trails. <laughs>